Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, hearing today. I'm Representative Kerry Bettinghoff. I serve as the policy chairman in Harrisburg. And we are very grateful for you being here today. And we are very grateful for Penn State Brandywine for hosting us. I happen to live up in the other bigger campus of Penn State, but we're glad to have uh, all of our branch campuses and the great work that they do here. Uh, some of you may recall we had wanted to do this hearing several months ago, and Mother Nature said no. So I want to personally thank Chris Quinn and his staff and my own staff for all the work they've done organizing this hearing twice. But uh, it's an important issue. It's an opportunity for us as legislators to learn. Uh, before we start, I'm actually going to have the members on the panel uh, identify who they are and where they're from, see some geographic disbursement through Commonwealth, and that's the beauty of the policy committee. We get to air a multitude of issues. It gives our members who may not serve on a specific issue when legislation comes through to be able to discuss uh, issues that will become before them before the House floor. So without further ado, and with the grand entrance of my good friend Jerry, we will start to my far left. If the member introduce yourself and where you're from, we'll get things started. Uh, thank you, Chairman. My name is uh, Brian Ellis. I'm a representative of the 11th District in Butler County. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairman. I am State Representative Eric Rowe. I represent the 158th Legislative District in Central and Southern Chester County. Thank you, Chairman Benninghoff. Becky Corbin, representing the 155th District in Chester County. Good afternoon. Dwayne Mellon from the 167th District, which is the eastern edge of Chester County, Malvern to Exton, Westchesterish kind of area. As I said, Representative Kerry Benninghoff, I am actually right in the middle of the state, Penn State area and uh, State College in Mifflin County. Good morning. I am Chris Quinn, and you're sitting in my district, and I want to thank everyone for coming out today. I am State Rep Steve Bloom from Carlisle in Cumberland County area, and uh, also grew up down right in this area, graduated from Pencrest Pen High School, which is just down the road. I'm back in the day, so I'm glad to be home in Delco. Happy to be here this morning. I'm Rick Saccone, representing Southern Allegheny and Northern Washington Counties. Good morning. My name's Jerry Knowles. I represent the 124th Legislative District, uh, which includes portions of Burke, Schuylkill, and Carbon Counties. Uh, very good. If for some reason throughout the hearing you are not able to hear, just kind of cup your ear, let me know, and I will make sure that we speak up. For those who come up before us to testify, please make sure the little green button on the microphone is on. And I would ask all members that are here in the room, not only just legislators, but everyone to please turn off your cell phones. Uh, this is going to be taped by PCN for someone who may want to see it later on, but I would appreciate cell phones being turned off because they do interrupt with our correspondence and our mainline streaming that's going on. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Chris Quinn. Uh, I want to again personally thank you for having us down here today. He's got such a beautiful community. I always enjoy coming down and driving through your area. And maybe we'll spend some money while we're here. Go ahead. Well, first off, I would like to thank Chairman Benninghoff for bringing the policy committee down to, to the district to hear testimony about this very important topic that affects all residents of my district. I would like to thank my colleagues who have traveled here to hear testimony on this critical issue that affects the entire Commonwealth. Finally, I would like to thank our testifiers for taking time out of their busy schedules to lend their expertise to this hearing and to help inform us as we look for potential legislative solutions for the pipeline safety. As you may know, just a few months after being sworn into office, I had members of the Middletown Coalition to Harrisburg to testify in front of the Emergency Preparedness Committee. Now I'm bringing Harrisburg to Middletown Township to have a first-hand look at our community. The Policy Hearing Committee, as well as my office, has reached out to Sunoco numerous times. So I certainly want to address the elephant in the room or simply the fact that we do not have an elephant in the room and the fact that Sunoco has chosen not to be present in these hearings. Um, once again, I want to thank Chairman Benninghoff for arranging this opportunity, and I look forward to hearing the testimony from all of our testifiers. Thank you. Well, thank you, Representative Quinn and all the other Southeast members for hosting us today. Uh, Becky, you are our strong female is going to be leading the group, group here, so keep these guys in line. To begin, uh, if, uh, Eve Mayari, 
I hope I'm enunciating that properly. Uh, the Clean Air Council wants to join us, and I believe with her will be uh, Virginia Marcel Kerslake. Well, the name like Benninghoff, I do my best not to butcher anyone else's up. She's a West Whiteland resident uh, for pipeline safety. You can start in whatever order you want. You can go left or right. Sorry. And for the members, I'm going to let both women testify, and then we'll ask questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Benninghoff, Representative Quinn, and esteemed members of the House Majority Policy Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Eve Miari, and I represent the Clean Air Council, Pennsylvania's oldest environmental nonprofit. I'm also a resident of this community. We are here today to discuss safety concerns surrounding the Mariner East pipelines and the regulations intended to ensure the public and environment are protected. I'm also here to discuss some of the ways in which the public and environment have not been protected, either due to absent regulation or an inability or unwillingness of agencies to enforce existing regulation. The Council is currently engaged in five different legal cases surrounding the Mariner East pipelines. As a nonprofit environmental organization, we work to hold Sunoco and the state agencies accountable to the law, the permitting process, and to our Constitution. Accordingly, we are in ongoing litigation with both Sunoco and the DEP regarding the permitting process and Sunoco's unsafe construction practices, which have resulted in damage to waters of the Commonwealth, drinking supplies, private wells, and private property. Additionally, in May of this year, we filed as intervener on Senator Andy Dinneman's formal complaint before the PUC with regard to the many safety issues associated with this project. But I'd like to begin in 2014 when, against federal recommendations, Sunoco reversed the flow and changed the material on an old 1930s oil line. That line, which previously carried refined petroleum products from Marcus Hook West to Pittsburgh, already had a history of leaks in our area. In 2014, Sunoco began using the line to transport hazardous, highly volatile liquids such as ethane, propane, and butane. The pipeline, now marketed as Mariner East One, transports these byproducts of hydraulic fracturing from the Marcella Shale east to Marcus Hook, where they are put on ships and exported to Europe as feedstock for overseas plastics manufacturing. Sunoco was able to assume the 1930s certificates of public convenience that went along with the old pipeline. In other words, Sunoco, a Texas-based for-profit company developing an export pipeline project, became a, quote, Pennsylvania public utility. This allowed Sunoco to claim the right of eminent domain, which is, which is how so many hardworking private home and business owners in Pennsylvania were forced under pressure, and in many cases under the threat of legal action, to give up their constitutional private property rights and their land to an out-of-state corporation. We're not here today to talk about eminent domain, private property rights, or the Constitution. We're here today to talk about safety. However, I would be remiss in proceeding to discuss the enormous threats to safety and environment posed by Mariner East without first pointing out the inherently conflicted dual mandate of the Public Utilities Commission. The PUC's mission to balance the needs of consumers and utilities and to protect the public interest while also fostering competitive markets creates a complex regulatory dilemma when it comes to dangerous industrial infrastructure. This relates directly to the regulatory gaps around pipeline safety as well as to adequate enforcement of public protections. Highly volatile liquids have uniquely hazardous properties. Unlike methane, natural gas, which dissipates up into the atmosphere, Ethane, propane, and butane are heavier than air, hang low to the ground, and can travel across distances, moving into low-lying areas. In the event of a leak, these so-called natural gas liquids, NGLs, expand hundreds of times in volume into a heavier-than-air and highly combustible gas cloud, which, in our densely populated area, would likely find an ignition source. In Folensby, West Virginia, when an ethane pipeline similar in size and pressure to Mariner East 2 failed, just 13 months after it went into operation, the resulting explosion produced a fireball with thermal impacts out to 2,000 feet. No one was injured or killed because the explosion occurred in a cornfield. One of the most astonishing aspects of the proposed Mariner East project is that no agency in the state is exercising siting authority. 
Sunoco proposes to transport industrial quantities of NGLs in close proximity to our schools, homes, senior living centers, daycares, and many other vulnerable sites. Despite the enormous risks to public safety posed by this project, no regulatory body at the federal or state level reviewed Sunoco's route plan with respect to public safety or questioned the logic of running a highly volatile hazardous liquids line through dense population centers. In Delaware County, approximately 25,000 residents live within the half-mile self-evacuation zone of the Mariner East pipelines. Risk can be assessed using a combination of consequence and probability. In the case of transporting highly volatile liquids through dense vulnerable populations, we have an unfortunate combination of high consequence and high probability. Since 1998, there have been nearly 12,000 pipeline leaks reported to the federal government. These accidents have collectively caused hundreds of fatalities and more than 7.2 billion, with a B, in property damage. Among all industry actors, Sunoco, ETP, has the worst accident record, with over 300 self-reported leaks since 2006. We are still cleaning up multiple accidents here in Delaware County from Sunoco's 8-inch and 12-inch hazardous liquid pipelines. But again, these environmental violations, egregious as they are, are not what keep mothers in Middletown Township up at night fearing for their children's safety. Sunoco has recklessly chosen to try to construct this industrial infrastructure within feet of structures occupied by the most vulnerable members of our society. I invite any member of this panel or the DEP or PUC to tour the Glenwood Elementary School, which sits 600 feet from the pipelines and an above ground valve station. The adjacent homes within 10 feet of the pipeline and the site on Lenai Road where Aqua struck and damaged Mariner East 2 in May due to a misrepresentation of pipe death, depth. We are lucky ME2 was not oper operational at the time as the incident occurred within 1,000 feet of the elementary school. The permits Sunoco required to construct this ill-conceived project were issued by the DEP and pertain to waterways, wetlands, and soil erosion, not public safety. Despite multiple attempts and enormous handholding from the DEP, Sunoco's permit applications were still incomplete and deficient at the time those permits were issued. The applications did not meet legal requirements and major flaws remained. A watershed study commissioned by concerned Delaware County residents revealed that horizontal directional drilling, HDD, for the Mariner pipelines would pose a risk of contamination to private wells, streams, and wetlands. These findings were presented in person by myself and other members of the public to DEP Secretary McDonnell in February of 2017. A week later, the permits were issued. Clean Air Council and our partners immediately filed an appeal of the permits on the grounds of their many deficiencies, and that case to appeal the DEP permits is set to go to trial in two weeks. To date, Sudoku has had close to 200 known spills of drilling fluid across the Commonwealth and at least six notice 60 notices of violation, some of which document Sunoco's failure to make required reports of spills. At least 16 private wells were damaged and multiple sinkholes opened up in Chester County. In Middletown Township, a frack out site between two apartment buildings has grown to the size of a swimming pool and has been ongoing since mid-April as a result of HDD. The DEP was warned in numerous public comments and meetings about the great risk of approving inadequate permits. These impacts were both predictable and predicted. In an attempt to get the project back on track, Sunoco has come up with another reckless scheme to reverse the flow and change the materials on yet another 1930s pipeline, this time their 12-inch, which has had no less than four accidents in our area, one just last month into Darby Creek. Once again, Sunoco is rushing ahead. As Administrative Law Judge Elizabeth Barnes stated in her order, in an apparent, quote, prioritization of profit over the best engineering practices. I want to leave you with a few thoughts today that I hope you will keep in mind as you consider the policies that govern pipelines and safety. First, residents across the state are still without access to clean drinking water due to Sunoco's construction activities of the Mariner East pipelines. In Indiana, Cumberland, Berks, Chester, and Delaware counties, residents cannot drink from threatened and contaminated private water wells. This is a trespass, a violation of private property rights and a violation of Pennsylvanians' right to clean, pure water guaranteed under Article I, Section 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. This violation of our rights will not be tolerated by the people of Pennsylvania. It should not be tolerated by the legislature either. 
Second, there are multiple locations across the state where construction of Mariner East 2 and 2X has exposed and compromised the currently operational Mariner East 1. In Cumberland County, ME1 has been exposed in a creek bed for over a year, despite residents' repeated reports to Sunoco and FIMSA. Up the road in Edgemont Township, both ME1 and Sunoco's 12-inch line are currently exposed and dangling from straps. Third, the threat to public safety that this project poses cannot be ignored. We know that the consequence of a leak and explosion along the Mariner East route could result in catastrophic impacts to life and property. Fourth, there is still no credible plan for residents to be notified or evacuated in the event of a leak. Sunoco's plan to run uphill, upwind, to a distance of half a mile is neither credible nor realistic. In fact, it is shameful to ask these communities to assume all the risk for the benefit of a private for-profit corporation. Fifth, no federal or state agency has jurisdiction over siting where this pipeline can be placed. When pipeline siting is not jurisdictional to any agency, we wind up with a gaping regulatory hole. This is a pipeline that was built through regulatory holes. Clean Air Council believes that Sunoco's plan for the Mariner East pipelines is incompatible with Pennsylvania's statutes, regulations, and constitution. The pipeline route, which was chosen for maximum convenience of the operator with little regard for public safety, the environment, or the public's right to clean water, simply does not and cannot comply with our laws. Therefore, construction on the Mariner East pipelines should be immediately halted. This legislative body must uphold Pennsylvania's constitutionally guaranteed rights, including protections of life, safety, security, private property, and clean water. Thank you. Thank you for the, can you hear me? Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this committee about Mariner East. I'm here today as a resident of West Whiteland Township with Mariner East on my property less than 200 feet from our historic home. It is essential that our legislators hear from the residents that are being forced to live with Mariner East and other future potential pipelines like it. This is my story. Three years ago, land agents for Sunoco came to our home in Exton with an easement and they told us that they were putting in two new pipelines. They told us no trees would be coming down because they were going to be doing HDD drilling. They told us the drill would be located behind the apartments across the road, out of sight, and out of hearing. Finally, we were told that we had no choice in the matter. Even if we didn't sign, they were putting them through our property because they had been granted eminent domain. So in the spring of 2017, Sunoco arrived one Saturday morning to our neighborhood and began to cut down several beautiful mature trees directly across the road from our house in front of the apartments that used to provide a screen and sound barrier as well as a beautiful streetscape. They strung an ugly gray curtain between poles roughly 20 feet tall and built a huge work site. This is how we learned that the drilling would be directly across the road from us and our neighbors. We learned that instead of two to three weeks of drilling, we were facing 350 days, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Monday to Saturday, and that the eyesore of the construction site could stay up in place up to three years. And we learned what it's like when they're drilling. The noise and vibrations is so loud that you can feel it inside the house and the windows rattle and you can just forget about enjoying your yards and gardens. But my story is not unique. I have heard from many people that they were told the same lies, right down to the exact same verbiage, you won't hear us, you won't see us, you won't even know we're here. The dishonesty and bullying is common enough that Senator Andrew Dinneman introduced a bill to regulate land agents and hold them accountable just as real estate agents are. Mariner East Drilling, started across show and road from us on June 13th of last year. Less than two weeks later, on June 22nd, Sunoco's drill hit an aquifer and groundwater poured down the borehole into the work site. For two weeks, Sunoco continued to drill while continuously pumping this water into trucks and carting off site to dispose of and not contacting residents of the impact it could have on their private water wells. 
Finally, around July 5th, Sunoco ordered, was ordered by the DEP to stop drilling. The hole was grouted to stop the flooding and construction at that site has been halted ever since. But the damage had already been done. 15 homes had to be put on public water instead of their private water wells. And less than two weeks after they grouted the hole, some of the water emerged on my property as springs and seeps and they continue to this day. Super saturating and flooding the ground on our property. We have had no response from Sunoco or the land agent in several months to our request to remediate this situation. But furthermore, this water flow and seepage is occurring on the path of Mariner East 1, the 90-year-old pipeline that is currently transporting highly volatile liquids. This presents concerns for corrosion and erosion, two causes of pipeline failure. And this isn't even the only accident Mariner East Construction has had in my township of West White Lynn. Less than two miles away is Lisa Drive, where in November of last year, a large frack out of drilling mud occurred follow and was followed by the formation of a sinkhole. On March 3rd, two days after pulling the pipe through the borehole, two more sinkholes, 16 and 20 feet deep, formed suddenly in the backyards of Lisa Drive, one right up against a house. So four days later on March 7th, the PUC ordered Sunoco to stop the flow of Mariner East 1 because of the potential for catastrophic consequences and it remained halted for two months. Residents of Lisa Drive and the surrounding neighborhood have had their lives uprooted by this. Their backyards are filled with workers, heavy equipment and security personnel around the clock, destroying their quality of life and privacy. Somewhere upwards of 30 cement truck loads of grout have been poured and compacted into their yards. You could say that quality of place has been destroyed as well. But as bad as all of this is, the worst is yet to come when Mariner East is in full operation, as Sunoco hopes, with several hundred thousand barrels per day of liquefied ethane, butane, and propane flowing through our communities. What I came to understand is that no, Mariner East is not just like all the other pipelines that crisscross our area as we had been told by land agents when they came with our easements. When there is a leak on this pipeline, these HVLs go back into their ga gaseous state and unlike methane, which is lighter than air and dissipates, these will not. They're heavier than air and will stay close to the ground. They're odorless because Sunoco will not add an odorant as a safety measure as this would ruin their intended end use, the manufacturing of plastics. All these gases need is an igni ignition source, such as a vehicle engine, a doorbell, or a cell phone for an explosion to occur. Even without an ignition source, residents are at risk of asphyxiation. The blast zone for such an explosion is 1,500 feet. I will remind you that my family lives less than 200 feet from Mariner East. Thousands of families in Chester County and Delaware County alone live within the blast zone. We are continuously being told that we have been living with pipelines like this for decades and that our emergency services are prepared for this. But the truth is we have not and they are not. In the event of a leak on Mariner East, Sunoco and FIMSA say to evacuate half a mile upwind on foot. How are residents to be informed that there is a leak when cell phones can set off the blast? How are those with small children, the elderly, or the physically challenged to evacuate when engines set off a blast? We get no answers to these tough questions when they have been posed to emergency services and regulators in public sessions. In West Whiteland alone, 11,000 people live in the evacuation zone. But here's the thing. If we get a chance to evacuate, we'd be lucky because in densely populated Chester and Delaware counties, there's a very real chance that be before we would even know there is a leak, it could be ignited and there would be no one left to rescue. This is not hyperbole. Pipelines leak and Sunoco, frankly, has the worst record in the nation industry wide. On PHMSA's website, there's a list of leaks that Sunoco has had since 2006 through May 2018. 298 leaks have been reported. 
This does not include the leak on the 12 inch line into Darby Creek in Delaware County that occurred last month. This is the same 12 inch line that Sunoco now wants to repurpose for Mariner East while they wait for 2 and 2X to be completed. And yes, that line runs through my property and my neighbor's properties as well. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I represent just one of tens of thousands of Pennsylvanians who are being impacted by Mariner East. For many of us, our homes are our largest investment and we fear the loss of property values. Our constitutional rights to drinking water are being put at risk. Our children are going to daycares or one of the 40 schools in the blast zones. Our older family members live in seniors' homes in the blast zone. We live, work, shop, and play within the blast zone. And for what? So that Sunoco can make money selling these liquefied gases overseas to make plastics. We need our legislators to uphold their responsibility to protect us from known dangers. Senator Andrew Dinneman has been a champion for us against Mariner East and has been joined by other senators and representatives from both political parties. But we need more. I implore all of you to visit your constituents on Mariner East. And if Mariner East is not going through your district, I ask that you go and visit one that does. Stop this dangerous, reckless project that should never have been granted public utility status in the first place. Because quite literally, lives depend on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, both Eve and Virginia, if I may. Uh, we have some members with some questions. We will start with Representative Milne. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's really a pleasure to, to be here in Delaware County with this hearing. I commend Representative Quinn for his leadership in Harrisburg in trying to advocate to make sure that we took this hearing out to the field so we could continue to get input and testimony from affected stakeholders that are literally here on the ground uh, where these issues are taking place. Uh, by way of a quick uh, comment before I segue into a question, I would just note for the members here that regardless of whether you agree or not with the panelists and I's point of view on a number of these pipeline issues, I, I would note that all of us have citizen leaders uh, in our districts that really are cause champions for an issue and I, I have just met Eve recently, but uh, Ginny and I have worked together uh, over a number of months on these issues, and I want to commend her for her citizen leadership on, on behalf of one of my townships I represent in West Whiteland Township. Uh, and she's truly a policy entrepreneur that has done tremendous work in our community to get citizens informed, engaged, and paying attention uh, to this issue, including I would certainly affirm contacting me, as I can certainly attest to from many emails and phone calls, as they should be, which is certainly a, a welcome part uh, of the process. And I'll also just uh, comment that literally 24 hours ago was when I first had an opportunity uh, by just happenstance to have a chance to invite uh, Jenny to testify today. And that speaks to her commitment and dedication to this issue, that she literally dropped everything to prepare and to get ready to come testify uh, before this committee today. So thank you for that response, Jenny. It's very commendable and helpful to the, to the uh, issue conversation here. One of the issues, as I mentioned, I get many emails, phone calls from your fellow West Whiteland residents. One of the issues I continue to hear about, uh, in addition to the numbers that you did note there on the whole number of facets of this, of the pipeline development, uh, is a concern about horizontal directional drilling, uh, in particular because going through Exton, the original plan, uh, particularly in the area of the Chester County, what people know is, as Exton Square Mall, general area where there's a high value stream there, uh, the original plan was horizontal and directional drilling. Somewhere along the line, the plan became changed. And I know that's prompted a lot of concerns uh, from residents and continuing attention about potential harmful effects on environmental standards, water quality, uh, and so forth. 
So again, you said you speak for many. I wonder if you could maybe collectively share your, your experience, what residents of West Whiteland uh, have noted and, and are perceiving about this change from the HDD. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for that question, um, Representative Millen. Um, so originally the plan was to HDD drill essentially through all of Exton, including the hillside that I live on. Um, there are two sections that cut right through the heart of Exton. They go under Route 100, they go past Chester County Library, they go through Suites for Chase and Meadowbrook Manor, which are two, uh, two neighborhoods, goes right past Exton Square Mall. So there are lots of things to get around. Um, HDD drilling was uh, the easiest way for Sunoco to do this, quite frankly. Um, but uh, at some point last year, uh, Aqua PA um, said that HDD drilling could not be done because it presented a, r a risk to the public aquifers um, that are in that area. The geology of uh, that valley that Exton sits in is um, it's a limestone formation, the Conestoga and uh, it's a karst formation. So it's, um, it karst is, has characteristics of voids and fissures, and it's a, a, a limestone feature um, that is prone to some instability and the formation of depressions and sinkholes. Um, HDD drilling through that area presents risks to, uh, to the its stability as well as to these aquifers. So um, anyway, Tonoco had to change their plans. They came up with a combination of HDD drilling in some sections, open trenching, and flex bore, which is a new technology. Um, I've heard it referred to as HDD light. So it's the same sort of thing. There are, there's drilling fluids, drilling mud that's going to be um, under pressure as they're drilling. It still presents some of the same concerns that HDD drilling um, presents. Um, so there's those concerns to the, to the construction, um, to the, uh, the risks that are inherent to putting pipelines through karst formations. Um, and then beyond that, we now have residents that live in Meadowbrook Manor that um, did not think that trees would be torn down, including uh, a, um, an area that's by the library that provides a green space for the community and um, additional impacts with the change in, in construction will have on wetlands that are back there. That's a flood zone. Um, every time we have a heavy rain, that neighborhood is, is prone to flooding. There are two houses there that have already been condemned by FEMA. Um, and now open trenching through there and changing the waterway e during construction and afterwards and removing those trees are, are of great concern to them. Um, it also means that the pipeline is, uh, I, I would say it's within 50 feet of Chester County Library. Um, Instead of it being tens of feet underground now, it's going to be just several feet underground. And that, uh, that presents a heightened risk for, for somebody down the road drill digging into it. Um, Eve spoke about what happened at, uh, by Glenwood Elementary when Aqua um, just a couple months ago dug into Mariner East 2. Um, and luckily it wasn't in operation. If something like that happened in Exton, beside the library, near the mall, near those neighborhoods, um, well, you can imagine what would happen. Um, so those are just some of the concerns we've had. They were voiced at a public hearing that the DEP held um, this spring in, um, in Westchester, and um, there's a long public record of, of those concerns. Thank you very much. I appreciate the questions and answer. Uh, before we go on, I also was remiss and didn't acknowledge one of our colleagues, Representative Greg Vitale. Thank you, to Greg, for joining us today. I believe next question is from Representative Quinn and Representative Rowe. First, I want to say thank you, First, I want to say thank you for coming out. Um, 
I think that this hearing is very timely in the fact that we are looking at the 12-inch line as far as making changes to it, and I'm hoping that the DEP is hearing your concerns loud and clear. Um, currently today, Pennsylvania is one of the only states that, don't ha that doesn't have siting authority, and I believe that's something that we should be actively seeking. Um, for me personally, one of the bills that I'm working on would give, to address some of your concerns, would give us a property owner bill of rights so that people begin to understand what they can and can't expect. But one of the questions that I have for you, because we're going to have other testifiers coming up after you, is what recommendations would you make? What changes do you think we could do to make Mariner 1, Mariner 2, and 2X safer? This for me? Yeah, sure. Don't do it. I, I honestly, I don't know how you can do it safely. Um, as I said, pipelines leak. When and if Mariner East One leaks, uh, it has no business going through densely populated areas like this. There is, uh, there's no plan because there can be no plan. I would like to ask one additional follow-up. Has the governor been receptive to you as far as the taking calls to, to your group coming up to speak with him? I, I have not personally communicated with the governor since December. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you to Eve and to Ginny for your testimonies. Many of the points you made address the concerns that I and my wife have, especially as new parents, we're now just n we're now uh, responsible not only for ourselves but also for uh, young children. Um, my district, uh, I have in my district, I have West Goshen Township. It's the largest municipality, the most populous municipality in my district, and part of the Mariner East uh, construction site is in West Goshen Township, albeit not in my part of West Goshen Township in Carolyn Committee's part, but nonetheless, it's very important to all of us uh, who in West Goshen. Um, and speaking as a representative from Chester County, although my district doesn't encompass the Exton Square Mall, all of us have constituents who do <laughs> frequent right. the Exton Square Mall or that library. I grew up going to that library, so this affects all of us. Um, earlier this year, I penned a letter to the governor asking him to direct a safety risk assessment of these pipelines um, and uh, to pause them until such an assessment is completed. I'm not a lawyer. Could either of you tell me what some of the legal ramifications of such an assessment might be? I'm also not an attorney. So I, I can't speak to the legal ramifications of a risk assessment. Um, what I can say is that none has been conducted um, at any level, to my knowledge. Um, we are aware that Sunoco has to perform some of their own assessments, and um, I've heard these referred to as internal hazards analysis or integrity management plan. These documents are not public knowledge, and so um, I have not seen them. I don't know to what extent emergency services have been um, privy to the information in which they contain. Um, but I, I also don't know how you assess and mitigate risk unless you I don't know how you mitigate risk unless you assess it. Um, and so that is an ask that has been made by residents of Middletown Township going back um, almost two years. Uh, it's an ask that's been made um, in this county. Um, and at this point, the only risk assessment that I'm aware of that's underway is one being conducted um, by a citizens group. Thank you. My, my background is in Homeland Security. And if there's one thing I know, it's this. It's that uh, government has no greater responsibility than to protect the, the people that it's supposed to serve. So, um, and I applaud that, uh, that effort to, to get a, a safety risk assessment completed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. It's very compelling. I'm glad we have hearings like this so that we can hear both sides of the story. Um, often in Harrisburg, I've heard one side a lot, but I haven't heard this side as much, so I'm glad to be here to, to listen to this. I do firmly believe that uh, we have a government. I believe in the old saying that uh, we have a government where each man protects the rights of all men and all men protect the rights of each man, and that's why we're here to protect the rights of each one of those people that under our Constitution, their drinking water should be clean and secure, and we should protect that right. I believe that. And I believe it's our responsibility to do that. 
So I have two questions. One is, um, and I come from an area, Allegheny, Washington County. We've got pipelines crisscrossing through it. It's been done safely. It's been we haven't really had any incidents there in our area, highly populated areas. But I have two questions. One is, what was done to the, for the people who had their dr drinking water contaminated, their wells or, or whatever? Uh, what was done to help them? Um, who did it, and was it the proper were the, were the proper uh, procedures followed? And two. Obviously, we've done this. You know, we need pipelines. We, we've, we, we, there seems to be a way to do this safely. You mentioned just a few minutes ago that you don't think it can be done safely. I, I'm, I'm really curious to see. Um, there has to be a way that we could do this safely, is what I'm thinking, because we do it in other areas safely. So, are there any areas of compromise, or we could do this, where we could have these pipelines that that would work for you, that you think would be, you know, that we could work to ha to make this possible while securing the safety of the of our resources and the people that live in the areas um, okay well the first question uh, what was done for the people uh, and and specifically it's people in uh, West Whiteland and Euclid Township uh, where the, the private wells were lost uh, Sunoco was ordered to uh, put those uh, private uh, to offer those homeowners to be put on public water um, and uh, and they did, all except for one uh, one homeowner who has refused. He prefers his private water well to public water, and um, and he is not hooked up. Um, his well has come back since they stopped drilling, um, and he, and he's using it. Uh, but there's a, a concern that when and if Sunoco can continue to drill that. Um, he will lose that water supply. But that is his, uh, his constitutional right to have that private water source. I will point out that there are areas uh, along Mariner East, and I believe um, Eve Miari mentioned them, um, where people's uh, private water wells have been put at risk by the construction. And there absolutely is no option for them to go on public water. There is no public water supply there. The only thing that they are being told is that they can have a water buffalo um, put on their, in their, on their property and they can get water from that. Um, but there is no long-term solution to what would happen if their private water wells were destroyed. Um, now, when it comes to terms of, uh, you know, we have to have these pipelines. The, how do we do it safely? Um, and they and, and you say that uh, these also crisscross your area, and there hasn't been incident. Um, I've lived in West Whiteland for 14 years, so I've lived with pipelines for 14 years. There are several of them uh, that are within close distance of our property. That one built in the 1930s has been there, um, not as long as my house. My house was built in 1797, but the pipeline's been there a long time, and as far as I know, nothing has happened. But those pipelines are different than Mariner East. Uh, quite often, they are um, they're gasoline or diesel fuel, and um, if there's a leak, um, it's more likely an environmental hazard. Um, if uh, one of the natural, <coughs> there's lots of natural gas pipelines, but as I said, methane is lighter than air. It's going to dissipate. It often has an odorant added. Um, there's ways to detect it if it doesn't dissipate um, quickly enough. Mariner East is not like that. We won't smell it. It doesn't dissipate, and it is much more dangerous than all these other products. Um, it really has no business going through highly populated areas like this. So if you must have it, if you must have it, don't put it through highly populated areas. Consider if you do need it. I would suggest that we do not need Mariner East. We do not need more plastics. We do not get need to get this product overseas for them to make plastics. My family, my community is being put at risk for a foreign company to make money. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ginny, there was, I, I've been following this stuff pretty closely because I have, the, the pipeline goes through the district I represent in Cumberland County as well, and I've sort of listened to a lot of information about it. There was a term you used, I think, and maybe I just misheard. I, I was just puzzled. I, I, I thought, what is that? And then I thought I heard it again, and maybe I, I heard wrong. 
Did you say something about frack out? Mm-hmm. What, what is, what does that mean? And, and <laughs> does it have anything to do with fracking? No. Yeah. So a frack out is often referred by the industry as an inadvertent return. So what happens when um, Sunoco, for example, is conducting their horizontal directional drilling is they have to drill into the earth. They have to go some distance and the drill needs to be lubricated in order to move through the earth. Um, and the drill is lubricated with a slurry that's made up of bentonite and other, um, other additives. And um, what can happen is that if there are cracks or fissures in the earth, which there are in different places, um, that fluid can then return to the surface. Sometimes there's an inadvertent loss, and so you, know, you start putting in a certain amount of fluid at one end and less comes out the other, but it doesn't come up. An inadvertent return is when it does. And so when we're using the term frack out, um, we're referring to an inadvertent return. So nothing to do with the actual fracking process, which is back at the well where they were actually drilling the, gra the, the drilling for the gas and they go like a mile down and they hit the, the shale layer and actually drill and then put pressure in there to crack that, that, that shale layer to allow the gas to escape, which is the actual fracking yeah. part of Right. Nothing the, the to do HDD, with fracking. The HDD would not go that far down. Right. And it's not, it's not fracking. It's just, it's just horizontal directional drilling. It's horizontal directional drilling that can result in the inadvertent returns. Okay. Yeah. So it's just an inadvertent return, but there's nothing to do with fracking involved in that, in that process. No. No. Okay. No. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Benninghoff. Um, Eve, uh, you had mentioned, and, and I, I think we all understand that there's no direct supervision from the legislature to an ex exact plan of a pipeline or for drilling mm -hmm. in that matter. We set out guidelines and uh, both through the DEP and the EPA and, and all those. But you said that at one point, and I just want to understand this, that Sunoco's plan had never been reviewed and then followed it up by saying then they changed their plan which I assume that was also not reviewed and then you made the statement that they did not meet legal requirements so that makes it sounds like Sunoco or anybody that was in the pipeline business can just do whatever they want now that can't be accurate so is there a a, a specific part of the statement that the plan was not reviewed that you have concerns about um, are you saying DEP didn't re do the review EPA didn't do the review right. the sure so what I said was that the plan had not been reviewed with respect to public safety that no one had looked at the route and made a decision does this route make sense for public safety or does it not um, the plan had certainly been reviewed extensively by the Department okay. of Environmental Protection. That's what I just Protection. wanted to I wanted people to know that we right. do but, actually but review the these plans Absolutely. on a state level the DEP is not jurisdictional to safety they're jurisdictional to the, the waterways and the wetlands and the soil erosion. Um, the, um, the whole domain of public safety is not jurisdictional to the DEP. Um, and in terms of you know, federal oversight, this particular pipeline, um, FERC does not have jurisdiction over the Mariner East project. Um, and the, the PUC, to my knowledge, does not have or does not exercise siting authority um, for this type of a pipeline. So it's just falling into a little bit of a regulatory gray area. Okay. And, and you know, I certainly, I think that's something that we as a legislature can look at tightening up, working, uh, you know, together with those agencies. And then my, my final um, question goes back with what Representative Saccone said in uh, basically that if we're not going to put it here, put it where else, and, and you came up with, the Virginia, you suggested that we don't need plastics, we don't need all these things in your estimation. And, um, but I, I, I come from Western Pennsylvania and we have just cited a, a cracker plant uh, in Beaver County. We're gonna have massive, we're having massive development. We're concerned about the safeties. We're, we're following up and, and we're making sure everything's in place. And I would argue that, and I understand your concept of saying this, but I think we do need it because of the, thousands of uh, family sustaining union jobs uh, that are involved with the quality of uh, heating options for, for folks in, in the city of Philadelphia, specifically in this case. Um, and obviously as a nation and as a state, when we export products, we do increase the wealth of the 
entire commonwealth. So I would just say that I understand your, your preferences of not needing these things, but the reality of, of what we face in Pennsylvania and the development of uh, both our commonwealth as a whole and our nation, I think the, the reliable fossil fuels uh, done in a safe manner are vitally important. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Can I respond to that? Yeah, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would just like to point out that Mariner East is not about providing fuel to Pennsylvanians or Philadelphians, uh, as was suggested. Um, I don't know that it, uh, Mariner East provides thousands of jobs, long-term jobs for uh, Pennsylvanians. I think they are primarily at Marcus Hook, and I think that's probably on the order of 100. But um, regardless, uh, of the number, I would suggest that there is no number of jobs and no amount of money going to the state that is worth putting so many lives at risk with Mariner East. Last question will be from Sharon. Thank you, Chairman Benninghoff. It was already pointed out that Sunoco is not present, and I think I probably should be asking them this question, but I am curious about your comments on this, because public safety is what we need to be concerned about with all of us, and we've all had contact with our constituents about these issues. Um, one more recently, just today, I had a woman ask me a question that I'm gonna pose to you because I real, I'm shaking my head, I don't know what the answer is. In the proposed 12-inch repurposing um, project, the line goes through an area in my district in Upper Euclid Township where there's a development on one side and Marsh Creek Lake on the other side and the pipeline is in between. Sunoco has, from what I've been told, suggested that in an emergency procedure, people should run away from. And it was brought to my attention that in this area, people can't run away from it because they'll run into the lake. Um, it's almost a rhetorical question, Jenny, I apologize. But the other thing is, has anyone, to your knowledge, met with our county emergency services department to discuss these things? I was under the impression that there were meetings scheduled and I never heard any outcomes of those. Um, by anyone, do you mean Sunoco yeah, or you I'm mean sorry, the residents? Yes. Yeah, no, I'm sure okay. the residents have had yeah. an active role with the emergency services. Uh, well, well, we have and, um, and I really, I, I'm, I'm not, um, I, I don't want to give the impression that we feel that emergency services is th that they're failing us or that they're not doing their job um, or that they are to blame. Um, they have been given an impossible task here and um, we fear for them as well as us. I don't think first responders should be put into this situation um, and it's almost as if uh, they may not be fully aware of all of the risks, I do know that uh, Chester County Emergency Services for a long time had been asking to see Sunoco's uh, risk assessment or um, I forget what they call it. Integrity management plan. Thank you, Eve. Integrity management plan. They had only seen bits and pieces of mm -hmm. it. They had scheduled a couple meetings and they had been called off. I'm not sure if they finally have. But when we ask them those hard questions, mm -hmm. how will you tell us? Like they'll say, you'll be informed, you just evacuate on foot. And Sunoco says the same thing. They send around these glossy brochures that say this is what you do in the event of a leak. But when you go and ask those questions, well, how will I know? How will I evacuate? My neighbor is in a wheelchair. My, you know, we, we know of these people. I live in a neighborhood where I'm on the lake and I, you know, are we supposed to swim away? Those are questions that w that they they aren't answering because I don't think they can answer. Yeah, I have written to the governor on this very issue and asked about what's being done regarding public safety in Title 35. One quick question, then I'll I'll be quiet. Um, was the contaminant ever identified in the public or in the private water supply? Uh, it, you mean the ones in um, in Euclid Township, like the in West Whiteland and Euclid? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, part of, the, part of the problem was a loss in pressure. Um, the other problem was that people's water was turning brown. Um, Sunoco is maintaining, and most recently I heard them maintain this at the PUC hearing, that that was actually just sediment that was stirred up from the bottom of the aquifer. 
They also made the claim that no bentonite, and that's the, the, the uh, material that's in their drilling mud, no bentonite was found in the water samples of those private wells. I don't think that they can actually <laughs> say that because they didn't test for bentonite. Bentonite is not a standard water analysis. Mm -hmm. It's not even performed at water labs. You need to send a sample to a geological lab and they'd probably do it by x-ray diffraction or something like that. I don't think Sunoco ever did that. We have never seen any results showing that bentonite was non-detectable. I don't think it was ever tested. So they're making a claim that that has no basis. Thank you. If I could just add one, sorry, final. Thank you, uh, Representative Corbin, for expressing that concern to the governor. And I just wanted to add that three school districts in our area have done the same. Two in Chester County, uh, Westchester and Downington, and here in the Rose Tree Media School, have all expressed that they don't have a plan to adequately mitigate this risk to the students. Um, one school in Chester County, the St. Peter and Paul, had a similar situation to Marsh Creek. They could either evacuate the children to the pipe or to the back of the school where they were all fenced in. So the current emergency plan at that school is they've put a gate in the fence. And that's the best that they've come up with without greater support. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Becky. I refer Becky as our resident chemist, as you know. She's a chemistry pass. When I have questions about things, I always call her on those things. I had two quick questions, and we'll uh, thank you guys for your testimony. Uh, you said about a lot of the other pipelines are there. Many of them have been here since 1930s. Uh, the majority of the houses there come subsequent of that, or were they there prior? Uh, it would depend on what neighborhood you're talking about. Um, well, my the, house one, is the ones that have been illustrated through the two testimonies that you've talked about. The Sorry, can you? The testimony that you and Eve gave, you, you cited some different things, provides some pictures. It's just curious. Oh, so the majority uh, of those houses have yes, been well, built subsequent to the, the pipelines, the original pipelines that were built? Yes, they would have been built subsequent to that original pipeline being built in the 1930s to transport liquid fuel. Okay, so that housing developments built around and on top of all that stuff. Yes. Okay. And the other thing I just wanted to state, uh, we are having someone from Delaware County Emergency Services testify as a former county coroner. I would tell you that most counties have different types of emergency plans, evacuations plans. They aren't necessarily always specific to each emergency, mm -hmm. but whether it's a flood or a massive brush fire, you know, the exercise of moving people is very similar. So we're anxious to hear that testimony. And I would encourage you to speak to your local EMS people. Uh, I know our state police have provided training and different things in our areas, whether it's uh, school safety or whatever else. That I think there are resources out there, and we shouldn't take for granted that they aren't there. We and and just to be clear, we we actually have spoken with them, and um, we hear some we hear some similar concerns um, that we have about that. So I, I have faith you got some good elected officials here. They're probably been sure that that gets done here on a local level. But thank you both very thank much you. for your testimony. Very thank insightful. You so much. If you could provide yours, Virginia, that was testified today, if you could give us a copy of it to either Bob or Morgan, and then we'll make copies for the committee, that would be very helpful. Can I, can I email it sure. to them? Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next panel will be Vice Chairman Andrew Place from Pennsylvania Public Utilities Commission. I, I don't know if uh, Sherry or anyone else that's with you is to join you. That is up to your discretion. Thank you. I apologize, I was writing so many notes I wrote over my own uh, agenda. We are also joined by Secretary Patrick McDonald with the Department of Environmental Protections. Uh, my apologies, sir. Absolutely. I'm an ongoing student who writes lots of notes. <laughs> uh, you, can join, you can start either way, left or right. And again, members, we will let the two gentlemen or their panel testify, and then we will ask you questions afterwards. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, Chairman Benningoff, uh, Representative Quinn, members of the committee. I'm Patrick McDonald, Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, with me today, I have Ramez Ziadeh, who's our uh, uh, Acting Executive Deputy Secretary for, for Programs, as well as Nels Tabor, uh, Senior Litigation Counsel for DEP's Office of Chief Counsel. 
On behalf of DEP, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify on the department's role in regulating pipeline construction. DEP's regulatory authority in the pipeline development is limited to earth disturbance activities and water resource impacts associated with the construction and maintenance of pipeline infrastructure. These regulations are contained in 25 PA Code 102 related to erosion control, 25 PA Code 105 relating to dam safety and waterway management. These same regulations apply to all pipeline infrastructure projects such as water mains, sewer lines, and gas pipelines. DEP does not regulate the product conveyed through these pipelines. The three main regulatory chapters that relate to construction uh, in short summary are Chapter 102, which regulates erosion and sedimentation from earth moving activities. Uh, erosion sedimentation, sedimentation control plans are required to be developed and implemented for all earth disturbance of 5,000 square feet or more. Additionally, a pipeline project that exceeds five acres of total earth disturbance would need to obtain an erosion control permit and would need to implement best management practices to control stormwater runoff both during and following earth moving activities. Chapter 105 regulates water obstructions and encroachments which are focused on activities in, along, and across wetlands, rivers, lakes, and stream corridors. And Chapter 106 regulates floodplain activities undertaken by political subdivisions of the Commonwealth, such as municipalities and, and public utilities. A water obstruction and encroachment permit combines into one DEP authorization, Chapter 105 and 106 regulated activities. DEP coordinates its permit issuance of the water, and obs water obstruction and encroachment permit with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Clean Water Act Section 404 permits which authorize discharge of dredged or fill material into waters of the United States. These regulatory programs relate to avoiding and or minimizing pollution to water, water resources, and in some cases, habitat. That is DEP's jurisdiction. We permit these activities in programs every day. These permits are some of the most common in the Commonwealth and represent significant environmental protections in our state laws. For major pipeline projects, the above are the primary permits we issue for construction. It is extremely important to DEP to provide the public with the most current and up-to-date information relating to the status of these projects. DEP electronically posts permit applications and the supporting documents for major pipeline projects to the DEP pipeline portal for public review, and that can be found on the DEP website. Currently, the portal contains information for Mariner East 2 and 2X, Atlantic Sunrise, Penn East, and Shell projects. As DEP receives more pipeline applications, we will create additional pages for, additional, for, for interested citizens. DEP has also held many public hearings and extended public comment periods for these projects. For Mariner East 2, DEP concurrently issued 20 permits three Chapter 102 permits, one for each DEP region that, that the project crossed, and 17 Chapter 105 permits, one for each county. Similarly, for Atlantic Sunrise, we issued a total of 13 permits, three 102 permits covering those regions, and 10 Chapter 105 permits uh, covering those counties. Current pipeline permits may include a number of project-specific special conditions to ensure environmental protection. DEP typically uses special conditions to enhance the protective nature of our permits. For example, these permit conditions can include the protection of private water supplies that may be impacted by pipeline construction activities to ensure drinking water sources are protected. In the case of the Mariner East 2 project, the Chapter 102 and Chapter 105 permits contained more than 100 special conditions. This is unprecedented and represented heightened security by DEP over the applications. DEP also requires that each pipeline application include detailed prevention preparedness contingency plans to address inadvertent returns that might occur during horizontal directional drilling activities. Oper operations performed in karst terrain or in areas where mining has occurred and the protection of water supplies. DEP works closely with county conservation districts to ensure projects are regularly inspected to assess the permittees compliance with all permit requirements. Projects are inspected on a regular basis by DEP and County Conservation District staff. The Mariner East 2 project was unique in terms of construction schedule and scale. The 307 mile pipeline project has been constructed almost simultaneously across the Commonwealth. 
Such a massive one-time construction project is rare and required DEP and the counties and the conservation districts to exercise unprecedented oversight and take strong, swift action to hold the operator accountable. Among these actions, new permit reporting requirements, which were significantly enhanced through the DEP January order, have enabled field staff to target active construction locations for timely inspection. During construction, permittees must address any inadvertent returns that result from horizontal directional drilling activities, spills of polluting substances, and impacts to water supply in a manner that satisfies all requirements of Pennsylvania law, including the Clean Streams Law, the Solid Waste Management Act, and the Land Recycling and Environmental Remediation Standards Act. Impacts must be fully addressed to the affected third parties and DEP satisfaction prior to resuming the activity. DEP also investigates all complaints from the public. DEP regularly and systematically coordinates with state and federal entities, and we will continue to do so. This includes the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency, local res first responders, counties, Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission, the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Wildlife Service, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, and the Pennsylvania Game Commission. With respect to sinkholes that developed in some locations during the construction of Mariner East II, DEP continues to be in regular and prop prompt contact with the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission and has coordinated site inspections accordingly. It is not uncommon for citizens to report suspected sinkholes to us, even though we are not the property ath proper authority to do so. To that end, we ensure that prompt notifications are passed along to the PUC and will continue to be diligent in notifications to our sister agencies and regulatory colleagues. DEP has taken and will continue to take strong, appropriate action should violations occur. DEP issues notices of violations and administrative orders requiring permittees to perform corrective action for pipeline installation activities that violate permit requirements and Pennsylvania laws or regulations, cause pollution, or present risk of pollution. Additionally, DEP will continue to hold permittees to the highest regulatory standards. In most cases, permittees cannot receive amendments to permits or have other work authorized until violations are remedied. On January 3rd, DEP issued an administrative order shutting down the Mariner East II project for a month due to compliance issues and lifted that shutdown order only when Sunoco had complied with all of the requirements set forth in the order. DEP also assessed an historic $12.6 million penalty for the violations that led to the issuance of the order, one of the largest penalties collected in a single settlement. DEP developed a grant program funded by this penalty, which opened on May 7, 2018. The grant program was open to projects that result in water quality improvements within the 85 municipalities located along the Mariner East II project corridor. Eligible grant applicants include the 85 municipalities, county conservation districts, incorporated watershed associations, educational institutions, and nonprofit organizations. Uh, to date, we've received 131 applications requesting uh, over $11.5 million, or, and we have over $11.5 million uh, to award. Scoring is underway now, and we, we expect to make announcements about those grants later this year. In terms of the pipeline route, you know, what you just heard in the last uh, panel is, is true. DEP has limited authority in this area. Uh, for Federal Energy Regulatory Commission projects, uh, siting and routing go through a detailed process. The company proposes a route that's examined by FERC. The commission may suggest alternates and modifications to avoid or reduce effects to environment, property, or more. And that process is governed by federal regulations, not dictated by any state law or regulation. DEP environmental permitting regulations can have an effect on pipeline route based on impacts to water or wetland resources across the project corridor. However, we can't arbitrarily or without regulatory basis dictate a pipeline route. Our regulatory basis is found in our statutory authority. For non-FERC projects, uh, PUC, who, and I'll, I'll leave it to them to explain, but they have limited involvement in, in the siting uh, of, of these projects. Uh, lastly, I'd like to take the opportunity, and I know this question came up in the last panel, to, to talk about a couple things that, that uh, uh, we may want to consider going forward. 
Uh, first, as noted, our authority is, is limited in this area. Um, and as was noted uh, in other forums and again today, there's a gap in state law regarding citing an authority uh, for pro citing authority for projects that are not under FERC jurisdiction. Uh, many other states have passed legislation to provide an enhanced role in citing decisions to their uh, public service commission or another agency. An overview of the interplay between federal and state regulatory regimes uh, in this regard is available through the Congressional uh, Research Service, uh, and there's a link uh, included to that in the testimony. While DEP does not believe the department as environmental regulator is well suited to take on the additional responsibilities for siting and routing beyond the environmental role we currently serve, it seems many of the concerns raised by members of the legislature and the public could be addressed by such legislation. Second, under Clean Streams Law, uh, DEP responds when informed of private water supply impacts. Uh, in 2017, DEP uh, put on the court record its policies and practices used to respond, investigate, and resolve private water supply impacts in the oil and gas context. DEP can require termination of the activity causing the private well impacts and can require restoration or replacement of supply under most of our statutes. DEP has done this in Mariner East 2 project case on more than one occasion. However, DEP currently does not have statutory authority to regulate private water wells. As such, at this time, DEP lacks an inventory of those private well supplies, well drilling standards, enforceable private well drinking water quality standards. Perhaps most important to note, uh, DEP lacks the legal authority to require such information be provided to the state and to establish and enforce standards. Without full records of existing wells, it's diffi difficult for DEP to proactively protect private drinking water wells. DEP did require Sunoco to use a database maintained by Department of Conservation and Natural Resources that contains some private well information voluntarily provided by residents to notify well owners near the right-of-way. This database is incomplete, but it's the most comprehensive one available due to the limitations from the lack of authority over private wells. In the absence of complete data in the state, the pipeline companies have been directly reaching out to property owners along the pipeline corridor to determine the existence of private water wells. DEP will continue to protect the private water wells through conditions set forth in the permits. DEP will continue to respond to and require restoration of private well impacts. However, DEP reiterates there is a need for a more comprehensive and effective approach to private well protection and regulation to ensure all private wells are protected in all DEP regulatory programs. Thank you again for inviting DEP to testify before the committee on this important topic. We look forward to continu continuing to work with the legislature to address these issues. I thank you for your time and I'm available to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Benninghoff, Representative Quinn, and members of the House Republican Policy Committee. I'm Andrew Place, Vice Chairman of the Public Utility Commission. I also represent, being represented here by Bob Young, Deputy Chief Counsel of the Commission's Law Bureau, and Paul Metro, on my far right, Manager of the Commission's Pipeline and Electric Safety Divisions. On behalf of the Commission, I thank you for the invitation to testify regarding pipeline safety, a matter of significant import to the Commonwealth. The responsibility to ensure the provision of safe and reliable public utility service to the Commission's citizens, sorry, the Commonwealth citizens and economy is central to the Commission's mission. The Commission's pipeline safety jurisdiction includes both public and non-public utilities. Public utilities include both natural gas distribution companies and common carrier pipelines for the transport of natural gas and hazardous liquids. Non-public utilities include pipeline operators, such as intrastate natural gas transmission and jurisdictional gathering lines, regulated under the Gas and Hazardous Liquids Pipelines Act, enacted in 2011, known as Act 127. The jurisdictional landscape for economic regulation, safety, and siting of natural gas and hazardous liquids pipelines involves several regulatory bodies, both state and federal, as well as several statutory constructs. The three main factors affecting the jurisdiction and regulation of pipelines are the commodity to be transported, the entity transporting the commodity, and the pipeline's geographic intakes and offtakes, i.e. intrastate or interstate. The transmission of natural gas and interstate 
Commerce is regulated by the federal level, by the Natural Gas Act, and the transportation and hazardous liquids and petroleum products in interstate commerce is regulated by the Interstate Commerce Act. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is the lead federal agency for both the NGA and ICA with FERC's jurisdiction varying under each act. FERC's authority under the NGA is exclusive and it preempts all state regulation of natural gas in interstate commerce. FERC issues certificates of public convenience, has siting authority, and approves rates. It does not matter whether the pipeline crosses state borders or if the applicable pipeline segment is located within a single state. If the pipeline is part of the interstate system, pipeline system, the PUC has no regulatory role. Example, sorry, examples of these types of pipelines in Pennsylvania include the Texas Eastern Pipeline, Columbia Gas Transmission, and the Texas Tennessee Gas Pipeline. By and large, the distribution of natural gas to end-use consumers is primarily regulated by the states. However, some pipelines delivering natural gas deliver directly to large end users, such as power plants, from the interstate pipeline system is subject to FERC's exclusive jurisdiction. The ICA is the federal law which governs the transportation of petroleum products. The ICA defines petroleum products as both refined petroleum products, for example, gasoline, diesel fuel, and heating oil, and petroleum hydrocarbons, for example, propane, butane, and ethane. Under the ICA, FERC does not issue certificates of public convenience or conduct siting. FERC's jurisdiction under the ICA is limited to rate review and approval. Additionally, FERC's role is non-exclusive, meaning a pipeline jurisdictional to FERC under the ICA can also provide intrastate service jurisdictional to the PUC. In fact, the Commission and FERC share jurisdiction over six intrastate hazardous liquids pipelines in Pennsylvania, including Sunoco Pipelines LP's Mariner East projects, Conversely, pipelines under the purview of the ICA solely providing interstate service are not PUC jurisdictional public utilities. While pipeline safety under the NCA, NGA, and ICA are the purview of the U.S. Department of Transportation's Pipeline Hazards and Material Safety Administration, FIMSA, the Commission has a formal agreement with FIMSA to enforce compliance with the pipeline safety provisions of these federal laws. The FIMSA agreement requires that the PUC have a federally trained workforce of engineers and an active compliance enforcement program. The prescribed federal training is rigorous, consisting of 25 classes at FIMSA's sole training facility in Oklahoma City. These cl classes are one week in length and require a two-hour test that engineers must pass to become federally certified. The PUC receives federal reimbursement for enforcement of FIMSA's regulations. Funding levels are approved by the U.S. Congress with a maximum reimbursement of 80% of direct costs. The PUC's pipeline safety program is audited annually by FIMSA. The audit reviews pipeline inspection performance and compliance enforcement actions taken by the pipeline safety division. In calendar years 2015 and 2016, the commission received FIMSA's prior report review scores of 50 out of 50 and 50 out of 50 respectively for both years. In calendar year 2016, the Commission received a FIMSA annual program evaluation review score of 115 out of 116. As stipulated in the FIMSA agreement, the PUC enforces compliance with the federal pipeline safety laws of public utilities and Act 127 pipeline operators. These pipeline operators include distribution operators, for example, UGI, Columbia, Peoples, etc., the transport natural gas from a transmission pipeline to the end use customer, residential, industrial, commercial, gathering pipelines in class two, three, and four, and interstate transmission pipeline operators in classes one through four. Federal pipeline safety regulations define these class locations, class four being pipes situated in the most densely populated areas, while class one being pipes situ situated in the most sparsely populated areas. Specifically, the Commission's Pipeline Safety Division employs a staff of 18 employees, one manager, four supervisors, and 13 engineer inspectors. One of, the two additional inspectors one of two additional inspectors has been hired, and interviews are being conducted for the other position. The, com the Commission's 2018-2019 fiscal year budget includes two additional inspectors and continue to review this complement as need arises. It is of particular importance to note that pipeline safety's responsibilities encompass a vast breadth of infrastructure, including 48,000, more than 48,000 miles of gas distribution mains, almost 29,000 miles of natural gas distribution services, almost 800 miles of natural gas gathering lines, 
over 1,200 miles of natural gas transmission lines and over 2,000 miles of hazardous liquids pipelines. In 2017, the Pipeline Safety Division conducted 1,745 individual inspections. I would like to note three topics which frequently arise during discussions of pipelines. Pipelines as public utilities, the use of eminent domain for new pipeline construction, and pipeline siting determinations. Pipeline transmission transportation services are defined as public utility services under Section 102 of the Public Utility Code. Section 102 recognizes the intrastate transmission by pipeline of petroleum products as public utility service under subsection 1.5 of the definition of public utility. The power of eminent domain is conferred upon public utilities by Section 1511 of Pennsylvania's Business Corporation Law, not the Public Utility Code. Section 1511 of the Business Corporation Law confers the power of eminent domain on public utility corporations. While electric and telecommunications utilities seeking condemned property con to construct area lines first must obtain commission approval before proceeding with a condemnation action, neither the Public Utility Code nor commission regulations require both sorry, prior commission approval for the public utility to construct underground lines, regardless of whether for the distribution or transmission of water, wastewater, electric, gas, or petroleum products, etc. The only prerequisite in the Public Utility Code for a public utility to exercise eminent domain is for it to possess a certificate of public convenience before exercising that power. Challenges to the exercise of eminent domain are adjudicated by the Courts of Common Pleas, not by the Commission. The Commission places a central focus on jurisdictional entities through the exercise of its general administrative authority to ensure that public utilities furnish and maintain adequate, efficient, safe, reasonable service and facilities. In the specific instance of hazardous liquids lines, FIMSA regulations require all pipeline operators to undertake continual integrity assessments as a constituent part of pipeline integrity management. Among the factors pipeline operators must consider are previous integrity assessments, the history of the pipeline, the product transported, and the existing and projected activities around the pipeline. With respect to Sonoco's Mariner project, I would comment. The Pipeline Safety Division has devoted a significant portion of its resources over the past several years to oversight of this construction, operation, and management, having spent 76 inspection days during 2017 solely on this entity. Commission inspectors are continuing this rigorous program, conducting inspections at least weekly. The Commission will also continue to monitor and inspect Mariner Project after construction is completed, consistent with our duties as a state agent for FIMSA. The Commission determined that the development of numerous sick holes along, located in the township of West Whiteland, Chester County, manifested a discernible risk to the continued flow of hazardous liquids through Sunoco's Mariner East 1 pipeline. Upon notification of these circumstances, the Commission suspended the operation of Mariner East 1, investigated any and all risks to the integrity of the pipeline from these circumstances, and placed the burden on Sunoco to prove that reauthorizing the operation of the pipeline is safe, reasonable, and in the public interest. The fully ratified emergency order remained in place until May 3, 2018, when the Commission approved Sunoco's request and the Commission's Bureau of Investigation Enforcement concurrence to restate transportation on Mariner East 1. In doing so, the Commission directed additional reporting requirements on Sunoco. On May 24, 2018, an interim emergency order to again shut down the operation of Mariner East 1 and the construction of Mariner East 2 and 2X in West Whiteland Township was imposed by a PUC administrative law judge after two days of hearings. The full Commission reviewed the interim emergency order briefs and the record and determined that Mariner East 1 could be restarted but continued the interim emergency order regarding the construction of Mariner East 2 and 2X in West Whiteland Township until certain information is sub submitted to the Commission as directed by its June 15, 2018 order. In addition, there remains a complaint proceeding before the Commission regarding the continued construction of NOCO's Mariner East 2 and 2X pipelines in West Whiteland Township. The complaint proceeding is pending and cannot be discussed here. To the extent that the public wishes to challenge any decision of the Commission regarding the Mariner Project, we have and will continue to afford due process to parties and members of the public who raise issues pertaining to the service provided by any jurisdictional entity. In closing, I hope my testimony today is to detail the PUC's role in addressing pipeline safety. 
The Commission is dedicated to its mission of ensuring safe and reliable energy infrastructure. Integral to that commitment, we will continue to work with regulated utilities, emergency responders, contractors, municipalities, other state agencies, and additional stakeholders to ensure the safety of Pennsylvania's infrastructure. I would note, um, on a personal note, I live on a farm in Greene County, um, and I have uh, four pipelines across my property. So this is not in the abstract. I have Texas Eastern, um, three lines. It's a petroleum, uh, refined petroleum product line. I have a Columbia gas transmission line. I have a Columbia gas uh, distribution line, uh, gathering line, um, and um, a large 20-inch uh, uh, high-pressure uh, gas line taking uh, product away from wells in Western Greene County. Um, so other than on top of my regulatory hat when I'm in Harrisburg and doing the duties and obligations of a commissioner, um, I very much clearly understand the concerns, issues before us on anything that comes before us. This is not an abstract. Um, with that in closing, um, I, any opportunity, any questions you'd like to ask, I'm here for your indulgence. Thank you both very much. We appreciate that disclosure. Uh, we will start off with Jerry Knowles, then Representative Ellis and Representative Malone. We have been joined by our good friend, Representative Warren Camp. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, and thank you all of the testifiers uh, who are here today. Uh, in listening, uh, you know, and I commend Representative Quinn as well as the members of the Southeast delegation, because uh, they represent you well in Harrisburg and they talk about this issue. And we all really, it's like we live in different worlds. I mean, where, where I come from, you know. I mean, I have, uh, boy, and I never realized how many pipelines we have in Pennsylvania. I, I have a pipeline uh, from here to the front of the building. Uh, you know, I get, from what they tell me, heating oil, jet fuel, as well as gasoline is transmitted. Uh, it's been there forever. Uh, Never, never really thought much about it until my wife and I were out walking one day and we saw these waist-high yellow and I, you know, what is that? And somebody brought it to my attention. So we've had nothing but good experiences. Uh, but I, Mr. Secretary, I'm not sure if anybody on the panel, but Ginny had talked about it briefly. She had mentioned the fact that this is completely different. Can someone on the panel explain to me exactly what makes this any different or any more dangerous than what I'm living with from here to the front of the building? Uh, th thank you for the question, and I, I, I'll, I'll talk to the environmental side, and if, if uh, uh, the vice chair has, has a, a comment on the safety. Well, I think on the environmental side, is it's, it's uh, uh, two sides, right? One is, uh, as I said in testimony, these are types of permits that we do routinely uh, within the department in terms of the 102, 105 program. Uh, and we've seen pipeline projects before. I think on our end, the, the, what's different in this particular case is the scale of, of the project. Uh, and as I, as I said in testimony, the continuous, you know, the, the uh, non-sequential but, but uh, uh, simultaneous installation of the pipeline. Uh, so it's, it's uh, happening across the entirety of the the more than 300 miles of pipeline all at once as opposed to moving in sections or, or things like that. Um, I was passing this along to uh, Paul Metro, who um, seconded on, I think, in this Commonwealth with depth of knowledge and expertise in this area. Representative, there's we regulate more than 116 different type of pipelines uh, operators in Pennsylvania anywhere from natural gas to hazardous liquids. Uh, the lines that are in Western PA, let's give an example of ME1s and the Sunoco line. Same line that comes all the way across the state, 342 miles. In some areas, it's in a high consequence area in Western PA. It's in the same high consequence area in, in Southeast PA. Same type of product in it. It's highly volatile liquids. Uh, some of the Sunoco lines, and there, there are several of them, carry highly volatile liquids. Some carry petroleum products, gasoline or heating oil or jet fuel. Uh, a lot of the transmission lines that come across the state carry natural gas. Depends on the type of product that's in the line and the, and the varying degrees of safety associated with those type of products. Mr. Chairman, follow-up? Thank you, Representative. The, the, 
I may have missed this, and if I did, I apologize. But uh, again, I think it was Jenny who talked about the fact that they're adding something to the gas that it, if, if there was a problem, that you would have the odor, you could smell it. And did I miss it as to why that would not be considered? Did, did I miss that? Yeah, I'm not sure you missed it, but um, yes, odorant is added to gas um, per captain, per captain. The, uh, but you can't, this is a liquids line. You can't act it. It would be ineffective to add an odorant to, uh, to a liquid. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Representative Ellis. Oh, thank you. Representative Quinn. Um, Mr. Secretary, Chairman, mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you for giving a great explanation. I've been on the Consumer Affairs Committee for uh, 10 out of my 14 years, and the collaborative work between the PUC and DEP and FERC and all the other regulatory agencies often is confusing, and I think you guys did a, a great job of encapsulating your roles individually on this. Um, but specifically, Mr. Secretary, I wanted to give you a chance. Uh, were you here for the previous testimony? I was. Okay, so um, one of the testifiers made the assertion that despite multiple attempts and enormous hand-holding from the DEP, Sunoco's permit applications were still incomplete and deficient at the time those permits were issued. Now, I know personally that for folks back in my area, not just pipeline people, but anybody looking to go through the, the DEP, I find you guys to be very thorough and very um, thoughtful uh, when you go through the permitting process. Do you believe that to be an inaccurate statement? I, I would say two, I mean, the, the two things I would say are one, I, th I think the department uh, uh, issued adequate permits uh, conducted over a year long review, as I said, with over 100 special conditions within those permits. Uh, the second piece I, uh, obligated to say is is uh, it's also the, exactly the subject as as was said in the in the previous panel of of the litigation. So, oh, okay. So fair enough. I, I just okay. I just wanted to make sure because that mm -hmm. making that statement, I guess that's what they're actually challenging you, you in court for. And but I guess both of you can say generically across the board, but specifically in in this pipeline instance. A violation occurs, they get shut down, they follow the the requirements to get back operational. They've done that a couple times, um, and there are higher standards after they've been shut down or suspended one time. Is that accurate? Sure. So uh, I, I'll speak to our end of it, which is we've we had the. Uh, shut down over the entirety of the length of the pipeline for the month in January, as I said. We also uh, have had individual moments of shutdown. Uh, I think important, because I think it gets lost in, in this, um, uh, you know, we, we are issuing notice of violations. We're issuing orders for what has to happen next once there is a violation. The purpose of the permit is not to authorize an inadvertent return. It's not to authorize... Uh, an impact to a drinking water well. That it, those are things that are not supposed to happen uh, within the context of these permits. There, there are contingency plans should those things happen, and we've been uh, 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 following up and making sure that we're, we're addressing each of those. I don't know if you, you want to address the, the actions you all. Yeah, going to add briefly, and I do need to be, of course, circumspect because it's an active um, investigation as well as proceeding before us. But the um, to your point, and certainly, A, I would steer you towards the record. I think the record in what we've laid out over the past several months in this case um, is the public record is quite clear on the additional standards required as we've moved through this process. Um, but also, just speaking generically, um, yes, uh, a, a violation would... Um, to remediate or to uh, to cure a violation, you would be obligated typically to higher standards, or additional standards. Okay, and then my final just thought to the two of you gentlemen, you don't even have to answer now, but feel free to uh, give me any suggestions down the road. If there was anything additional powers that we you would like to be prescribed that might be beneficial for situations like these in this industry, but as well as any other industries that the legislature may be able to afford to you, to your groups. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Mill. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chairman Quinn. We're good <laughs> up there. So my uh, context for this, this question is 
I would concur with my good friend Jerry Knowles, who represents a very different type of district that, than I do in the eastern part of Chester County, and my friend Warren Camp does as well in eastern Chester County, in that it really was sort of a wake-up call about 10 years ago when a number of us first discovered that we did have so many pipelines in the ground in Pennsylvania and in, and in Chester County in particular, and I just happened to represent the district that the first major pipeline in many years, many decades even really, actually came through that part of Chester County, including bearing the brunt of it at the time, uh, both East Whiteland and West Whiteland. So we've had some experience uh, with these matters along the way. And that was one of the takeaways to the, the observations both uh, gentlemen have raised about the complicated regulatory uh, schematic that we're in between the federal side and the state side. And that experience 10 years ago was the first that many of us, including myself, uh, even learned or heard of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC. And given that experience, a, a new four-letter word was added to the lexicon uh, based on my residence experience with that particular agency. But that's the federal side. Uh, we're here, of course, at, at the state side. And this is the serenity prayer. We control what we can control uh, at the state level. I, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Place's uh, observation about the focus on the sinkholes, particularly in the Lisa Drive area of, of West Whiteland. And I do appreciate and applaud the very assertive efforts uh, that the commission did take to shut down Mariner 1 uh, during that time, uh, and also Mariner 2 to look at some of the construction issues. One of the ongoing uh, responses I've continued to hear from, from residents in West Whiteland, particularly with the sinkhole issue in particular, is a lot of concerns about the geology of the area. Uh, some of this speaks to our, our, the larger conversation we've had about how this is a much more populous area several decades later than when Chester County first experienced the pipelines going into the ground. Developments change, permeous surfaces change, obviously there's much more of a density uh, in the area. And the question is, can the geology of this area even support some of the continued construction? Uh, many residents assert to me that the drilling activity has triggered uh, some of the geological problems that have been experienced in West Whiteland, among other places. So a specific question and a global question. One, in, in terms of the order to allow the pipeline to be reopened for Mariner 1 and then potential reopening of Mariner 2 construction, to what extent are geophysical studies and metrics going to be part of that decision-making metrics, uh, for, particularly for Lisa Drive area in particular, but then more globally, how, how do we factor geophysical considerations into deciding what is safe, what is going to be of environmental um, environmental quality can be protected along the way. Just how much of a factor is geology going to be brought into the decision making here, and can it, and what regulatory authority you even have? Because maybe that's something we need to address as a legislative body. Yeah. Um, thank you. I very much appreciate the question. Um, being cognizant of my restrictions as a judge in this matter, um, uh, Paul Metro has kindly offered to be responsive. Representative, uh, I'm on the prosecutory side of the commission. I'm in the investigation enforcement section, and we do not advise the commissioners on, on any matter, so we're, we're prosecutory. I can tell you that in, in Lisa Drive, since the Lisa Drive uh, sinkholes that occurred, we hired a full-time geophysicist. Uh, we have a company called ARM out of Hershey that we had hired full-time. Anytime that we get an inadvertent return, we have a sinkhole, anything to that event, we require Sunoco uh, through the authorization of the, the authority that the Pipeline Safety Group has to, to perform four geophysical tests. We also have an agreement with them prior to any further HDD that they are going to perform these four geophysical tests. So what I would like to see is prior to any HDD, I want to see what the geology is uh, in the ground. And Performing those tests will tell us if the HDD is the best way to go or if open excavation is the best way. Then I want a, a, another geophysical test performed after the pipe is done, after the pipe is pulled through. I want to determine 
I want our geophysicists to determine if the geology has been affected or in what way it's been affected. So that's how we, starting from the Lisa Drive incident, that's how we have been uh, performing these different inadvertent returns and sinkholes that are occurring. If, Maybe you could just slightly elaborate then, it, just for my edification, perhaps my colleagues let, let edification, what statutory authority or specific grant of right does the PUC believe it has to incorporate geophysical measurements, standards, metrics into deciding whether this project, always in particular, is the one under discussion today, but, but in general, that a pipeline anywhere in the state can, can be considered safe and is not going to have inadvertent terrain disruptions? Well, that, that's a good question. We don't have specific regulatory authority to do that. That's an issue that when, while we work with Sunoco, we said, hey, because of what occurred at Lisa Drive, we need more information prior to you doing these HDDs. The PUC is not responsible for HDD permitting. We have no, no horse in that race. But we do look at the construction of the pipelines and if it's done safely. So, and we may be pushing the envelope a little bit with Sunoco saying we're requiring this, but they voluntarily have, have accepted that and they are performing that right now. And, and if I may, uh, on our end, we uh, uh, do look at uh, exactly that kind of geotechnical analysis. In fact, one of the elements of one of the orders was a reevaluation of more than 60 locations where, where Sunoco was engaged in, in the horizontal directional drilling uh, to make sure it's adequate. To one of the points you've made, I mean, I think, I think uh, and, and it's a reason why these things are violations of the permit, uh, we, we have seen uh, uh, all sorts of erosion sedimentation, all sorts of HDD activity, you know, types of activities have taken place in this area, in this kind of geology in the past. Um, so, you know, what, what part of the order was for us uh, most recently was making sure we had operational plan in place, making sure that, the, the, you know, we forced there to be additional training and, and some other things just to make sure we weren't having the same types of issues we, we had been having previously. I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Sure, and um, you know, we have reviewed uh, many reevaluation reports, and in certain instances, we required Sunoco to explore other ways to, to construct the pipe. So, where we felt that HDD was too risky in a certain area. So, um, you know, so that is the purpose of these reevaluations. We take these issues very seriously, um, and we address them promptly, and we make sure moving forward that they are going to be continuing to with the construction in a safe manner. It's, with regard to your specific request for where the statutory authority of the commission comes from, there are very broad general powers under the Public Utility Code that allow Paul and his staff to work directly with the utility under the threat of if they don't, he'll file a complaint saying they're not providing safe and reasonable public utility service. So they've got an incentive under the public utility code to comply with the staff level requests to do certain things. Because if not, then Paul, like they did in the uh, emergency order for Lisa Drive, investigation enforcement will file something with the commission and the weight of the commission comes down on the utility. And as far as the EP's authority is concerned, you know, we've required these reevaluations where uh, and when they had an inadvertent return impacting a water resource. So if there is a discharge to surface waters or groundwater as a result of the activity, that is where our jurisdiction lies. While we're on the geotechnical analysis questions, I'm going to throw something in real quick. Are these uh, requirements limited to only oil and gas exploration in the fields of energy? Or if I were to want to put a windmill up and have to put a footer in and something like that, would they also apply? So for, for our Chapter 102, 105 requirements, those are broadly construction uh, permits and, and regulatory requirements that would affect everything. I mean, you know, frankly, it's not even an energy-related thing. It could be a warehouse. It could be 
uh, housing development. Um, we're looking at the wetland impacts, stream crossing impacts, uh, erosion sediment controls, both during construction and, and, and after construction. So when I say we're, we're providing permits uh, for the construction here, I mean, that's truly what we are doing. The permits on our end and the permit application is about construction activity. Thank you. Our next question comes from Representative Bloom, then Representative Quinton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think my question would be directed to uh, Chairman Place, but if anyone else has an answer to it, certainly also chime in. Uh, a lot of fears have been raised around this, this particular project that we're discussing today. And my question is, um, have you assembled or do you have access to any statistics as to the frequency of accidents causing injury or death along pipelines generally or uh, even specifically related to pipelines that are, that are carrying natural gas liquids. Um, I, I guess it's, it's very hard to assess the comparative risks when you're, you're hearing about certain dangers, but we don't really know the relative danger compared to perhaps transporting energy products via truck on a highway or via uh, trains. I know there were the, the big oil trains that were carrying a lot, of, a lot of oil tank cars. There were some issues with those. Do we have any kind of statistical, um, I guess, framework so we can really evaluate these, these risks that we're talking about today? Um, yeah, the statistics are readily available. And um, I think uh, the landscape is quite clear that transporting product by pipe is the safest of all the uh, modes of transportation you indicated. Um, I'm speaking generically, of course, and certainly not speaking about the issue before that uh, the snow issue before us today. Um, but in some ways, um, as the commission and my colleagues can correct me if I'm off base here, but um, our role is to A, determine is this in the public interest, and B, to ensure that it's um, constructed, operated, and maintained in a safe and reliable manner. So we narrowly focus on the proposal before us, pipeline, um, you know, uh, any any piece of infrastructure uh, that could come across the board, we regulate 8,000 utilities. This is a whole host of issues, but we will take each, each individual one and look at it in isolation. Is this um, being managed safely and appropriately? Do we have the proper regulatory oversight? Are we um, adjudicating our responsibilities under, um, whether it's FIMSO or any of the other acts that we um, operate under, are we operating to those standards? Are we managing? Are we regulating to that? So um, I, I would, that was my only sort of sense that it's specific to each piece. Um, and as a policy question, yes, and as we're discussing here, yeah, we, we absolutely can be part of the conversation, be stakeholders in the conversation about good policy choices, but that's quite a separate bucket, of course, than the specifics to any project before us. Yeah, and I guess, obviously, the, there's always going to be risk associated with, with every activity. I, I just, just think on a macro level, it would help, I think, all of us as policymakers to understand just, just, just what these relative risks are, how they compare, so that we at least feel like we are making sound policy choices. Yeah. I, I appreciate the insight. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. And before coming to the commission, I used to be on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon, and, and that's what we dealt with, um, is risks across the energy space. Um, uh, and it's a n-dimensional point space when you think about it. Um, you've got environmental risk, you've got safety risk, you've got economic risk, you've got to balance that a bit, um, you know, do all the calculus about cost-benefit on all of these, um, on anything we undertake. Uh, and I would correct the record at one point on the previous panel. Uh, they noted that all of they implied or it did state that the product is not being consumed in this uh, um, in this Commonwealth, it's specific to the ME2 line, but that's actually not the case. Um, there are three offtakes of propane in the Commonwealth, um, which is clearly an important uh, heating source for many thousands of Pennsylvanians. Um, but that said, um, if uh, yeah, it, it's a very difficult calculus and an endless one that we'll never absolutely say uh, respond to, but I was contemplating this when I was preparing uh, my statements and uh, thinking about this hearing, um, that if you're living next to a, a piece of infrastructure that has risks associated with it, that's your world. And I get it. I, I absolutely get it. Um, and whether it's on my farm and I've got a gathering line 30 feet from my, 
my back porch that was built in 1899. That's the world in which you operate. So um, I'm, I'm always thinking that, yeah, in the, in the general and what we think, the world we need to think about, the regulatory framework we need to build and to respond to, um, yeah, we, we, we build these constructs and really think about risk. Um, and this world here on uh, natural gas pipelines or any sort of um, hazardous pipelines, um, it's a voluminous. I mean, it, as was pointed out to me, the, the paperwork on a pipeline um, integrity management plan would fill up the back of a pickup truck. Um, it is detailed, extraordinarily detailed, and we review those internally in the commission frequently and at least annually. Um, so it, it's not in any way unregulated or even lightly regulated. It's very strongly regulated and built a construct over 80 years to do this. Is it, is it perfect? Of course not. Um, but it is, some of the fundamental questions for me are, do we have really good regulatory constructs? And I think the answer by and large is yes. And then do we have strong regulatory oversight, um, the DEP or the PUC? Um, and my experience here is that yes, we do. Uh, we see the regulations we, we are required, mandated, and obligated to, to respond to, and we respond to those. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Vice Chairman, I, I certainly appreciate those comments, and I certainly, I'd like to take off on that specific issue because in my community, being able to provide them with some type of risk assessment is paramount. It is to, to the point where we certainly have many competing factors providing us with various points of information, which isn't necessarily um, similar in any way. But, but just taking this in a slightly different direction, it's my understanding that Sunoco is looking at repurposing an additional 12-inch pipe for this Mariner project. And it's another... Um, just older pipeline that wasn't necessarily constructed to the same um, characteristics that you're building ME2 and ME2X2. And it concerns me. From your perspective, who is conducting the, the, the risk analysis on that project that can be shared with the community? And, and two, have you received any type of feedback from the governor? Or, or is your organization and the governor, are you both believe that that's an acceptable risk? All right. Um, again, um, I'm in an uncomfortable position that i um, not used to being a wildflower. Um, I raised cattle in western Pennsylvania, and I'm used to facing off 1,800-pound bulls. That said, that's not my role here today. Um, so excuse my circumspectness because I clearly am a judge in this. And, and Paul mentioned it earlier. We have a, a firewall, a lioness decision that says within the commission, we have the judicatory side in which I sit, and then we have an investigative enforcement side in which Paul sits. And that's a hard and fast wall we do not cross. Um, I cannot ask uh, Paul to start an investigation and what they're doing um, I cannot know about until it comes up before me for adjudication. So I wanted to assure we were all clear of the landscape in which we have our restrictions. Um, the, uh, that said, just a, a bit of your comment about the governor and so on. Uh, we are an independent agency. Um, do we see the facts before us? That's my obligation. That's uh, what I swore my commitment to when I came in. Um, so there, again, is um, I completely live in the commission's world. Um, um, the risk analysis is a very challenging question, um, and in no way do I want to duck it. Um, I, in, in this world, we think we refer to that as pipeline integrity management. Uh, and um, again, not speaking specifically of the case before us, and Paul probably has degrees of freedom I do not have. Um, but when a project is being built in its simplest form, you must account for the risk, um, geologic, geographic, population, of where that, you know, the material that's going to be transported through that pipe, the material that pipe is made of, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, I think there's nine uh, criteria that must be considered, in a, and again, maybe I misspoke, um, when you think about a pipeline integrity management plan. And that is not a, that's a living document that has to, that migrate every year that has to be updated. So as reality changes, for example, population increases close and you have more um, uh, high impact zones, uh, high, I'm sorry, um, high consequence, consequence, 
thank you, high consequent areas, um, that plan must um, evolve. And the obligation of the operator is to continue to reduce the risks on that pipe. Um, so uh, as we talk about class one through class four, um, when you have the most rural areas where I live, um, that is the least reg heavily regulated. But as you get more towards class four, those are the most heavily regulated pipe. Um, by and large, pipe is built to class four standards because the operators know that populations can increase and they don't want to have to be uh, replacing that pipe. So they build to those higher standards typically anyway. But um, the, it, and I, I, this is not a dodge, in any way it's not a dodge, but the, um, those pipeline um, integrity management plans are shared with first responders and emergency managers, um, and uh, if they're not, that's a violation of our code and obligations. We need to know it if they are not. Um, and um, secondly, uh, the only caveat, and I, I'm careful with this one, is that because transparency to me, again, a dirt farmer from Green County, transparency matters. Um, you do need to be careful about how much you share about these risks uh, across all these in infrastructure pieces, whether it's a critical piece of infrastructure, uh, um, a, um, a electric substation um, that's critical to the grid. Um, if, that if that's public knowledge, then those are, you've put a target on those pieces of infrastructure. And I know that is not going to be a peace of mind to people who live near these pieces of infrastructure, but that is a, regrettably in the world in which we live, we cannot be making targets out of uh, pieces of infrastructure and putting folks at greater risk by publicizing where the highest risk points are. Um, that would be not only illegal and, or unethical for us to do, but is not um, in anybody's interest. So. I can speak a little bit to the workaround. Uh, we got a construction notice from Sunoco about uh, maybe two, three weeks ago. They also filed a construction notice with FEMSA. As soon as that construction notice comes into the commission, we get a copy of it. So we assign four engineers full time to look at the 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 rework, or we call it the bypass. What, it, what that means is that we're investigating this. We're looking at, uh, we sent out two sets of data requests. Uh, we met with them last week on the, on the bypass along with DEP. So we'll, uh, we'll be out on the site, we'll be investigating, we'll, we'll observe their construction, we'll look for uh, and observe whether they're compliant with the federal and state regulations as it pertains to this bypass. So we're in the middle of the investigation. There's a lot that I can't get into right now because um, we haven't received some of the data requests back yet. And your point to the risk assessment, uh, we monitor the risk assessment annually. Uh, we, we audit it. Every time we do an inspection on Seneco or any operator, we are doing some portion of that risk assessment. The risk assessment is just one piece of the integrity management plan that they are required to have. And as the vice chairman said, it is a dynamic document. Any kind of change in this bypass um, proposal would be a change to their integrity management plan. So we have to go back into the integrity management plan and review the risks associated with this bypass. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Secretary McDonald, I sense a level of frustration in part of your testimony, and I want to confirm that because it's the same level of frustration I have, and it's regarding construction of private water wells. Um, since I have been in the legislature, we have had bills before the legislature, th the three sessions I have been there, regarding standardizing construction of these wells, and it can't happen for whatever reason. We can't seem to get it through. Would this be a help to you in your, um, in this situation, we talked about it, you know, the inadvertent returns, the contamination of, of private wells. I mean, we need, to, from what I see, we need to get this legislation passed. And do you know how many states have these construction standards, roughly? Um, so on, on the last question, I honestly cannot remember if it's 40, I want to say it's either 48 or 49 that have it. Uh, I thought that, that was, I thought that uh, was the case. That, that we do not. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's absolutely impactful for us, particularly, you know, and it goes to exactly, uh, 
the conversation we've had about you know these pipelines going through a populated area. We have conditions in our permits requiring this permittee, any other permittee, to be protective of those those uh, drinking water wells. But we don't know where they're at, and there's no way to to direct people to that. There's no standard for that construction. Um, and, and, you know, separate from even kind of pipeline issues and things like that. I mean, we've, we've uh, uh, seen wells dropped near like septic oh, <laughs> tanks. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah. It, it's a much bigger issue than, than just uh, uh, resolving this. Uh, I'll say to be blunt, I, my, my sense has been uh, the thing we come up against is, you know, it's, it would be a big regulatory challenge on our end, which, which mm-hmm. means staff and money mm-hmm. um, we've had some fee proposals but I think there, there's a fear that n- none of our fee proposals have been this but there's a fear that we would quote end up like charging people per gallon out of their own well which is not the intent that that we would have on on any of this so I, I'm more than open to and welcome further conversation about what we can do about uh, private drinking water wells, both for this and a number of other issues. Um, a follow-up to one of my colleagues' questions regarding the 12-inch line. Since you are an executive branch under the governor, I did write to the governor on, on this issue as well, the, the safety issues uh, surrounding this proposed 12-inch line repurposing. Have you had a conversation with the governor? Is he aware of it? Does he have any... Um, comments on this? Yeah, I, I haven't had a conversation directly with him about the the twelve inch line uh, in, in particular. I know uh, in the past, and this is you know some of the conversation that's gone on between governor's office and and the the utility commission. He's been supportive of risk assessment studies and and, and trying to get some things done there, but but wants to make sure that one, it's it's the right organization doing it and two that there's actually a regulatory hook that it's not uh you know it's meaningful that Mm -hmm. that it that falls into a place where there there can be some action and it's actionable at the end Mm -hmm. okay thank you um another comment that was made by a colleague that made refreshed my memory on the siting authority Mm -hmm. um that's just something since this is a policy committee meeting and we should be talking about what I mean we've talked about a lot of things but I'm very interested in what legislatively we can do to help these situations and the siting authorities that representative Milne talked about I mean this pipeline you know 10 11 years ago FERC did have the siting authority for that pipeline but they were looking at maps that were decades old that had drive-in movie theaters mm. that were now full of you know, houses and housing developments. So bringing it down to a more local level is something I'm certainly interested in, would be willing to talk to anybody about doing that. And, and I think we'd, we'd welcome being, you know, being part of that conversation broadly. Um, and if I may, I, as would I. I, mean, I think I may be, and I don't want to speak for my fellow commissioners, on it, but I suspect I'm a minority in the commission, but um, I think signing authority is a, is a very fruitful conversation to have. Thank you, Representative Corbin, and for all those answers. We will round out with Representative Saccone and Representative Camp. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. Um, I also come from Western Pennsylvania, as I said. We have these pipelines crisscrossing our area safely, high-consequence areas in some cases. Um, But here, these people have some real problems, and they have some specific examples, and their concerns are are real, and we, we had some good testimony about that. Uh, they just want truth. I mean, it, it, you know, across the, the country, really, people are disappointed in their government and other authorities that stand before them and say, you won't hear us, you won't see us, you know, we're, no, no trees will be taken down, there won't be any disturbance, we'll be out of here before you even know it, and then things happen. Um, so even when we do these risk assessments, people want to know that they can rely on it, they want to they trust, they want to trust their government, and they want to trust these authorities, but they don't, because they've been, you know, they've had these, these instances that, that have ruined that that trust uh my question is this so uh considering the the concerns of the people here is it even viable are there any options can can is it too late to have these this pipe rerouted to to take into consideration the the high density areas or is it just all high density and you can't there's no way to reroute it is there is there anything that can be done that can help assuage the concerns of these citizens or are we just is this just going to plow through and so, so the 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 couple things I'd say one just you know uh, was struck by something uh, the vice chair said a little bit ago that 
that yeah, you know, we're we have uh, regulations, permits, authorities, uh, you know, across the Commonwealth, but ultimately, right, every one of these decisions that we make ends up uh, in somebody's backyard, on somebody's property, and 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 we we need to be cognizant, conscious of that. I know the governor's been supportive of, amongst other things, you know, as mentioned, Senator Dinneman has uh, some bills, and one of those is is exactly related to this. Uh, I think I think it was even mentioned in the prior the the land agents, and and making sure there's some oversight of that where where what they're told can be truthful and and to be clear that's that was the company telling uh, uh, those property owners that this is the way it would be that that uh, 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 turned out not being so uh, you know I think you're absolutely right about the the trust in government on on the latter point i'll just say uh, you know i don't think that's something that's certainly not something we've looked at like today is a reroute of this would that even be possible assuming we had any regulatory authority around that which which as as was stated currently we don't so it's it's not without that authority it's not certainly not an exercise we've engaged in in any in any way um, I would just add, if, um, the PUC better be responsive. Um, I hope we are. Um, and if uh, comments are made that, um, that the laws may not be followed, that there's violations of any obligation out there, um, we have to know. Um, and it's certainly my obligation to be to know, to to be aware, to uh, be responsive to that. Um, I've been to Lisa Drive. I've been to the Turnbridge Apartments. Um, I think my car can find its way to, to uh, this neck of the woods uh, without me driving it. Um, but uh, I did just want to re reassure that um, since this is a, in a way is a public hearing, and I regret in a way philosophically we've got our backs to the public, um, <laughs> there something seems wrong about that, but it's unavoidable. Um, but the, um, my head will explode if we're not being responsive to what is out there. Um, and given the restrictions of, of course, that we have an open case before us. But outside of that, not only with this case, but with whatever obligations there are or the utilities in which we regulate, um, we better be getting those and we better be attentive to those in the commission. One, one quick follow-up. Has the operator, in this case Sunoco or other operators in general, have they been responsive? Have they been good neighbors? Have they been self-reporting? Have the, have the majority of the leaks and incidents have they been reported by them? Have you had to go out and find them yourself or citizens reporting them? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? It's a little bit of both. Um, we have a lot of engineers in the field, and we run across um, instances where, for example, we'll see a St. Cole and it wasn't reported to us. Uh, so we will inform DEP, and, and we get together and we go see it. And other times they're very upfront, and they'll let us know as soon as they have uh, some, some issue. Uh, for example, there was a line hit uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, we were there within two minutes with Sunoco. So... Uh, it, it varies. They're doing a better job than they were uh, prior to Lisa Drive. It, it, and I'll, I'll just comment on our end. It's, you know, we, we've definitely seen improvement, uh, as, as I think was just referenced, not perfection. To be blunt, some of the NOVs and orders that we've issued have been related to them not reporting things to us or, or not, um, uh, for example, uh, there's a requirement if if they encounter that inadvertent return that IR uh, that they stop and report it. Well, in some cases, they were you know earlier on they were continuing to drill through, uh, and and all of that has has improved. But that was the nature of some of the orders that that we issued them and and the shutdown that we did in January. Thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, real quick, there are a lot are there a lot of sinkholes and or gas leakages that occur. In nature generally even outside of areas that don't have drilling going on in Pennsylvania I may have had schools yeah. built and all of a sudden they got to stop other, other got types stinking. of like if there's another construction activity that that causes uh, changes in stormwater conditions you know like if you pave over for example a large area that's currently meadow or wooded and you don't really treat the stormwater runoff properly and it's karst, yeah, you could potentially uh, cause sinkholes to, to form in those types of situations. So sinkholes do, do pop up as a result of other 
human activities on the surface or underground activity. So it's not just HDD. How about as far as gas leakages? Just go ahead. I mean, I, I'm just curious. I remember reading an article years ago that you know the Earth's crack, surface cracks and under the ocean floor, oils leaks out lots of times, and we've seen how quickly Mother Nature cleans that up. So I was just curious. Yeah, we, we experience a lot of straight, we call them straight gas issues in, in western PAs, um, anywhere from outside of Ebensburg all the way to North Versailles Township in Allegheny County, Washington County area. Uh, it's it's an issue that we deal with every day because uh, once we get that straight gas issue, we have to determine if it's coming from a pipeline or is it coming from a natural source and then have to have the gas tested. And and uh, sometimes we have to shut off services to customers until we can determine where that gas is coming from. Stray gas, you're saying, that can be spontaneously just leaking somehow. Correct. Okay. I appreciate that edification. I yeah, believe. And, 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 and I'll just add, I mean, you know, for example, in our – uh, uh, regs and statutes we have now, you know, on the oil and gas side as an example, because methane can be naturally occurring. Sure. Uh, presumption that if there's a well nearby, an oil and gas well within, I forget how many feet, uh, the presumption is that that well caused that, unless they had done a pre drill look at the water to determine, you know, so there are some things we've done in that regard to make sure we understand uh, up front, because after the fact, it can be hard to suss out uh, uh, what caused what. Right. It's good to have those baselines. Right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Representative Camp. Thank you, Chairman Benninghoff. And uh, down here in southeastern Pennsylvania, we actually have a lot of karst, right, mm -hmm. limestone deposits. It's a serious hazard for construction all over southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, so. I just, with respect to the repurposing, which is um, obviously news, um, at least the proposed repurposing. Uh, so the first question that I had, I guess, is answered. That is within your jurisdiction to investigate. Uh, is, is it within your jurisdiction to approve? Let me handle that one from a legal perspective. There, there's no, for existing utilities, that change service characteristics inside their service area. There's no specific pre-approval requirement that covers this type of pipeline resurfacing. Utilities, if you think of it on the electric side, if there's an outage, they feed from different substations all the time. For, as a utility perspective, workarounds are quite common. The systems are designed to build those in. This is not as common a situation, but fundamentally it's no different okay, to, provide, so to provide service through alternative facilities. So there's no pre-approval requirement. It's, a done, it's being looked at as a, a compliance to make sure that all the appropriate filings are made, if any. Sometimes they require tariff filing, sometimes they do not. And all the applicable regulations governing construction activities are followed. But the concept itself, there's no pre-approval requirement in either the public utility code or our regulations. Okay, so you don't, just to parrot that back to you, I think what I heard is you don't have the power to approve or disapprove the repurposing, but if there is construction that needs to be done, um, you can examine that and determine whether it's uh, safe or appropriate or, or meets uh, whatever the rules are that are already in existence. That's correct. We, we will check the, the uh, pipeline. There's a number of construction items they have to, to work out right now, mostly on valves. It's a little over $3 million of construction costs. And we'll look at that to determine whether it's in compliance with the state and federal regulations. And is there uh, some expected time when uh, that repurposing would begin? Um, after you've reviewed these things? The construction notice is for 30 days. It's a 30 days construction notice. They began construction, I believe, on um, July 16th or 17th, and it ends sometime around August 17th or 18th. Sometimes it takes longer to get some construction project done, so they'll notify the commission when that con construction project is complete, but we'll be there every day anyway, so we'll, we'll, do, we'll see that for our own, uh, our own eyes. Okay, I know we have another panel to get to. So just one other area. So, and I, 
my apologies for coming in uh, late, but and perhaps this was covered. Let's say this pipeline is um, finished and, uh, and, and begins doing the work that it was planned for. What, what does a homeowner uh, expect in terms of yearly uh, looks by the government or the regulatory authorities um, to you know, give them some comfort that there is continuing oversight? There, there's a number of, of type of inspections that we do on an annual basis, Representative. Right now we have 43 different type of inspections that we perform. Uh, anywhere from uh, daily to weekly to monthly to annual to, to some of them are every two or three years. In addition to that, the federal government, the FEMSA inspectors, will also inspect this pipeline. Their frequency is a little bit different uh, because they have more interstate pipelines to look at, but uh, they also will, will have the opportunity to, to review and audit this line and inspect this line. So we'll be looking at this line uh, frequently, uh, at least at a minimum annually, when we do their distribution integrity or their integrity management uh, audit. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the panel's uh, duty and uh, service to us today and to the Commonwealth. Appreciate it. We'll be back in touch. Thank you very much. Our last set of panelists will be Tim Boyce, the Delaware County Emergency Services, and Sam Marshall, Insurance Federation of Pennsylvania. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate your time being here. Whenever you are comfortable, uh, we will start. I'll flip a coin, or who okay. wants to start? What the heck? Uh, I'll go first. Um, Sam Marshall with the Insurance Federation, uh, and here on the, I mean, I'm, I'm looking out the window, and, and we may get a quick in-person exercise in stormwater management in Delaware County, uh, so I'll try to be brief. Um, but the question, uh, I mean, I was fascinated by the earlier panelists. Everybody spoke about risk evaluation, risk analysis. And uh, the, the one thing that was left out of it was who pays if the risk becomes a reality? Uh, you know, who covers it? Um, uh, you know, I, I think that's a fundamental question. I, I believe it was asked at the Senate hearing of the PUC, and, and I think at that hearing, Sunoco also testified. And um, I'm not sure there was any clarity in that. I'd recommend it you follow up with, uh, with PUC, with, with DP, with Sunoco, with, with, with anybody you know, involved. Um, everybody does risk analysis, risk assessment. Um, who pays for that risk if it becomes a claim, a real cost? Uh, the question uh, you know, we, that, that have been raised, and I represent the insurance industry, homeowner, you know, personal lines, commercial lines, agricultural lines. Um, the question had come up. Um, are you insurance companies going to cancel people if they have a pipeline going through their back lawn? Uh, you, you, you're no longer going to issue coverage in, in those areas. Uh, you, you know, it, it wouldn't be redlining. Is that going to become a different exposure? Um, and we've faced this uh, in the past as well with some of the private wells out in, the, you know, in some of the western parts of the state. Uh, the answer is, as a general rule, and I can't speak for every insurer in every instance, but as a general rule, we will not. Uh, we don't ask it in the application, uh, who has a pipeline running through or what, you know, and, and we, don't, you know, we don't consider it at renewal. Um, it, it's, not, it's generally not something that, that, that is asked about. Frankly, if it were, You'd have heard about it in the 1930s. Uh, you know, there was reference made to pipelines going in back then. Uh, you'd have heard about it as developments went up over existing pipelines. Um, you know, that's, that's not something there. The one thing that, and, and we said it to consumer groups, to you know, friends of mine who asked, because I live down in this area, um, you, you always check your policy. 
Um, you know, generally, we don't cancel or non-renew or refuse to issue on something like that because we may not cover it. Uh, you know, there will be exclusions in your policy. And a, a public utility uh, asserting an easement and, and running a pipeline over your policy, that, that's the type of thing that's going to be excluded within your own policy. Um, you know, we would also have, if your, you know, your neighbor may have the pipeline and if it blows up and somehow your house catches on fire, uh, that's something your insurance company would cover and then would have a subrogation action against the, uh, against the utility uh, that, that was responsible for the pipeline. Uh, but those are, you know, as a, as a general rule, I mean, we're, we don't stifle pipeline innovation and, and we recognize the need and the practicality that, I mean, it's there whether it's this pipeline or, you know, electric wires running through. I mean, everybody has some sort of, you know, underground means of transporting fuel, electricity, you know, sewage, whatever it is. Uh, you know, so uh, we, we, we don't cancel or non-renew. Um, I can't say that that's uniformly the case in every instance, uh, but that's certainly the general rule of thumb. Um, you know, but I, but I would recommend, if, if you're talking to your constituents, if you're asking the PUC, uh, you know, if you're talking with the utility companies, um, check each policy. And, uh, and it should be, um, and, and we had asked, had, had the question asked in the Senate hearing, and we weren't convinced of the answer or the clarity of it, and the, the panelists before now didn't touch on it either. I mean, everybody talked about risk. But it should be something that I would think in a PUC order um, approving a pipeline easement, that there would be a section on who's liable if something goes wrong. Um, we were, we've been a little bit surprised in a lot of these deliberations. Uh, the administration had a pipeline task force, um, 60, 70 people on it, all different sections. And you know, those of you who know me know I'm a pretty sensitive fellow. Uh, nothing about insurance. Yeah, I mean, we, we somehow weren't invited to the table uh, to talk about who would be responsible if something were to go wrong. Um, it was, we didn't know about it. I mean, you, if we had known about it, we would have said, hey, how about including us on it? Um, but we, we weren't notified of it. Um, I do think that's a, you know, I mean, it, it's great to talk about risk. Uh, the, the, the really important thing, certainly from an insurer's perspective, is to talk about who's responsible for that risk. Um, but I would say, um, just uh, in the very narrow end, um, you know, I, I live in this area and have, a, I, while we don't have the pipeline running through our property, I have a lot of friends who do. I understand the concerns, um, I, you know, as, as other people, you know, talked about before. I mean, it's a very personal one. Um, but I would say uh, that there are going to be a lot of fears. One of them is not that you're going to have your homeowner insurance canceled. Uh, you're not going to have it non-renewed. You're not going to have a pipeline surcharge uh, stuck on it. You know, that's, that's certainly the general case, um, with, and we represent the overwhelming majority of the homeowner insurers in Pennsylvania. Happy to answer questions, but turn to Tim first. Thank you, Sam. That's very helpful, actually. Uh, Tim? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representatives, and welcome to Delaware County. My name is Timothy Boyce. I'm the Director of Emergency Services here in Delaware County. Uh, Delaware County is a great community. We welcome you here. We're home to uh, many different neighborhoods. Most are served by uh, first responders who are volunteers uh, in our police departments and the state police jurisdiction. In my role as Director of Emergency Services, I have two uh, primary functions. One is I manage the 911 center here, so communications issues are something very near and dear to me. And the next uh, is emergency management coordinator. Uh, I really see our role as the second responders, the support agencies to our first responders, our local communities that are at risk. Uh, we address this issue, pipelines, uh, and I was trying to frame the best way of looking at this. You know, Why am I an Eagles fan? Well, if, if you grew up in Delaware County, the refineries have been part of our, our life uh, forever. Uh, with that, I do need to recognize that maybe I don't see it as clearly as outsiders may or people new to it. But uh, when you say the word Sunoco or the pipe, you know, these are people that we work with in our communities every day. Many of the people at the refineries are our first responders. So uh, we don't often look at it as disparate groups. But uh, again, recognizing, I think the other end of the spectrum is that uh, we're doing something wrong 
at my level because we're not communicating with our stakeholders. The people are so worried about this and very passionate. I think, Representative, you spoke about it earlier. Uh, you know, the people who have taken on this cause aren't, aren't doing it so for a potential profit or, or for giggles. You know, they're taking on this cause because they're genuinely concerned. So uh, to the end that we need to improve that, and, and county council has been very clear to me, and, and Representative Quinn, we've talked before on this as well, uh, what can we do to improve the public's understanding of what's going on here in a reasonable way? Uh, one of the ways that the Delaware County is addressed, and it, it's been a hot potato, is this risk assessment idea. Uh, what can we do to put some parameters around here? Uh, we respect that my colleagues from the PUC, and uh, you know, oftentimes what I can say, what I can't say, uh, th that's not that doesn't pass the common sense to a lot of my constituents. They want to know. So the council has asked me to, to look into this uh, to, to try and get a, a firm understanding. I do recognize as a first responder that bad things can happen anywhere. So a catastrophic release of this product under the worst conditions is possible. Uh, I don't ever want to shy from that. But council's asked me to look at what's reasonable to expect. Is it reasonable to expect a leak, a, you know, a rupture, uh, the frequency of those things? Uh, what would be the general consequences for that, given different neighborhoods that we live in? Uh, this part of the county you know, uh, is a little bit more spread out. Others are very dense. So could we kind of get that understanding? And one, to help us uh, frame, but I don't think solve the problem for a lot of our constituents, but frame the idea of what's reasonable. Look at it in a comparative way. Uh, we're home to Interstate 95, 476, the port. You know, the Port of Philadelphia largely exists in beautiful Delaware County. Uh, the runways at the airport. Uh, how do we frame that for our very, very limited, and I'll go back to the pride of my first responders, but our very, very limited uh, first responders who have to prepare for a lot of things all the time and are being tasked at balancing those responsibilities. So there's some of the takeaways that we're looking for a risk assessment. Uh, I wish I could say it would solve all the problems, but as we spoke, uh, there's so many factors that could go into it. Uh, we had a, a severe weather event here in Delaware County over the last year, and a power failure for four hours is different than for eight hours for 24 hours. A power failure in one of our communities served by those with intellectual disabilities is different than those that, you know, we could all get up and leave this room probably. So that's the part where the slippery slope goes down on, on can I answer everyone's concerns. Uh, what I could ask you for, and you know, uh, I'm not afraid of an ask, is, is, is always the con an understanding of the constraints our first responders are under, the genuine sincerity they take it with, but uh, what they're being tasked with is enormous. Our first responders are answering uh, more calls for service and also in more communities. So even, ha even those that can dedicate the resources and funding to, to make specific site plans for different facilities, uh, it's really based on everybody being here and everything going on. Uh, some of the other things that I've heard from uh, many of my constituents is communications. Our communications models are based on healthy people, for the most part of means that we can reach. And uh, you know that covers a lot of people, but uh, trying to communicate people uh, with different disabilities. We, we're, we're grateful we have a number of uh, residential communities here in Delaware County, a long history of service to those people. And uh, can we communicate to every resident and then can we evacuate every resident? Uh, those are areas that concern me, but putting that burden back on my local person who, who works in the community, donates their time, comes here to advocate with you is a struggle. Uh, and you know, money doesn't solve everything, but somehow we need to recognize that if, if we do have these challenges, you know, can we detect them early enough? Are we doing everything we can to detect them, both involving our community and using technology to make us smarter at it? Uh, can we communicate that threat in a real-time method? And, th and that benefits us in an all-hazard approach. You know, if there's severe weather coming, can we reach everybody? Uh, is there a release? And uh, can we evacuate all those? And uh, one area that you know, is particularly important to me is our ability to evacu evacuate those of, of, with special needs is not as simple as we think. 
uh, and I saw my partners from the state police here, you know, we'll, we'll get everybody out of the house. We'll do pretty good on a block. But, you know, real time, you know, evacuating a center is a challenge that uh, we, we need to address. And again, just re respecting our whole community. So uh, if there's any questions for me or. I thank both of you for your testimony. I'm going to take Chairman's prerogative and throw a question out first. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things I was looking specifically from your organization is if we were sitting here talking about wildfires or mass flooding or any other kind of catastrophe, would you not pretty much have similar answers to that? Because uh, I can't imagine that you haven't had models and maybe some mock drills. When I was county coroner, we did mock drills for a multitude of different type of things that um, I would think that some of that infrastructure is already laid out there. I think the general public or anyone's listening just need to know that our EMS systems, whether it's in Delaware, Center of Mifflin, or Chester County, mm -hmm. has a generalized plan for disasters. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, specific to this, too, we've done a number of things. We've tried to improve our technology for warning systems and communication. The county uh, has spent their money. We've spent uh, state homeland security money and UASI money on technical equipment, improving our ability to detect and support our first responders. We've conducted a number of tabletop exercises with the community, uh, largely based on this, that we're meeting, we're working together real time, uh, on a couple different scenarios, but these pipeline events and specifically, we've worked with those uh, and conducted field exercises. I've had the benefit of going, you know, to the refinery where you know where these places are stored, to visiting sites, to visiting control room, asking those questions. So we do try and take a all hazards approach to this and practice as much as we can. And last on that, previous testifiers talked about pipelines been in place since the 1930s. How many times have you had to respond? to explosions or have to do those types of evacuations in that type of time period? Uh, it's a curious thing. In the last just couple months, Delaware County had two fairly significant events. We had a release of a hydrocarbon product uh, that was by the Darby Creek that was in an isolated area. So we worked through that. We had a, uh, no way to describe it, a catastrophic release of a propane tank truck that happened to be empty. Uh, that released in the community, that did give us uh, you know, moving bigger in power of prayer, it worked out, but it did give us an opportunity to detect, put all of our systems together, of our warning systems, our management systems, to practice what we're doing. Uh, the consequences were, fortunately, the product was empty for the most part, but it did allow us to implement that. But for the most part, uh, we do not have a significant amount of events related to pipelines or our, our industrial facilities along the port. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Representative Quinn, then Representative Cone. First, um, hmm. first, I want to say thank you for coming out. Um, I have two questions. One is, you say green light. Is this on? Green light. All right. A little better. Green go. Do you think that the training that you've received is adequate from, from, from Sunoco, from other providers? Do you think that the training is adequate? Yeah, when it comes to training, uh, you know, the response of the community really is to detect identify, you know, communicate that threat, and then coordinate an evacuation. The response plans for pipelines are, are fairly simple in that we just want to get everybody out of the way that's in danger, wants to release. We want to contain the release and then control it. Uh, so we have practice with Sunoco. We practice, uh, we're very, uh, Delaware County has a local emergency planning committee, like, like all the counties, but ours is very robust. We meet uh, quite frequently. We probably have 60 different corporations represented in our group where we work together at all times. We share training opportunities. Uh, we share, you know, cases that we went over. And uh, most recently, that group helped produce a pipeline emergency planning guidance uh, with collaboration from member of the stakeholders so that we just have that common operating picture represented that when there is a problem, we're ready to go and we've practiced. Uh, Site-specific training for responders, uh, if we relate it to this product a little bit, our local role really is to uh, warn, communicate, and evacuate the area. Well, specifically, what is your communication method with residents along the pipeline? Mm -hmm. Do you have? Sorry. We have a couple systems. We use the state system to put an emergency warning message out. We also have a system, a voluntary system, we sign up called Delco Alert, where we could reverse to the area 
and then we also work to geo those back uh, through phone lines to call people. Uh, it is a system in place. It is not a perfect system, uh, but it is a system in place. Do we need people to actively reach out and sign up for Delco Alert, or is it a reverse 911 type system? Uh, we have both. The Delco Alert one is, is specific to the county. Uh, it's similar to most of our surrounding counties have a, a, a reasonable model, and actually we can reach out and, and activate those. But Delco Alert signs you up for specifically for Delaware County. And then the emergency warning systems are the Commonwealth systems that we would employ. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Sam, I'd like to ask you, I, must, I might have missed it and I apologize if I did. So when, insure, when a uh, company, an operator is building a pipeline, they take out a, a, as, as part of their insurance policy, does it cover when they have these incidents and accidents uh, so homeowners' wells are contaminated, that, that, that they, they make an insurance claim for that, or how does that work? Um, I can't speak to the pipe, to the insurance company that the pipeline itself gets, um, you know, but, in, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to look into that. I'm not, you know, but I would, I would imagine, and certainly any, you know, I mean, the PUC would probably know that. Uh, certainly, Sunoco would be able to tell you just what coverage they have. That's probably the more appropriate place. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciated your comment about evacuating people with special needs, and it's um, just a comment. But those of us who are from Chester County do remember how critical that is with the Barkley Friends fire that happened in Westchester when we actually had members of the public coming out in the middle of the night to help wheel out senior citizens who were unable to help themselves. So thank you for that reminder. Your radio system, 911, everything up to snuff and it's good to go and you don't have any problems where there might be incomplete communications or hills and valleys um, where you have trouble communicating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, specific to our radio system, uh, it is a historical system uh, with needs of improvement. We are on a little bit of a tangent. We're, we're still on what's called the 500 megahertz system, which the FCC is uh, asking us to move off of here in Delaware County. That has limited our ability to make improvements. So it's an issue I've raised with County Council and we're investigating now uh, how we can make improvements at a time when the FCC is limiting our ability to do anything uh, with it. So that, that's an area. Uh, we also have uh, concerns with our radio systems about the openness of it. And uh, so we are looking at areas of improvement directly related to radio communication. And as Western Delaware County, that's an area we've raised several times uh, working with my, uh, my partners. Mm -hmm. And the solution set has been a, a thank you to Chester County. Uh, Chester County, uh, Bob Cagle out there work, work together very well. And we're looking at uh, how closely we can come together to back one another up or improve those areas. It, we did have the issue. And there were parts in my district where there was limited 911, I mean, radio coverage. And we wanted to, we meaning the county, wanted to construct a tower. And people objected. Mm -hmm. People objected to a tower when, you know, it could help them in a matter of public safety. So thank you. Mr. Marshall, uh, there was some discussion about insurance for the pipeline company. Uh, are, do you know, are there risk assessments done by uh, that kind of a carrier before they they write the insurance? I would think that there would, I would hope there would be. Uh, and, uh, and I would imagine that they would, uh, I mean, particularly if you're dealing with somebody like Sunoco, um, you know, that's probably gonna be a policy that's going to be partially self-insured. I mean, you know, they're, I mean the, the insurer is administering it and, and would, almost serve as a reinsurer. I mean, it's, it's a probably, I mean, it's not, you know, th th those aren't generic form policies, I and mean, there are only a handful of them, uh, relatively speaking. And I'm sure that uh, any good underwriter and an insurer would say, I want to see whatever risk evaluation or risk analysis that you prepared with the PUC, and I want to see anything that any public official with oversight of the pipeline would have prepared on that risk assessment. And that would, again, all figure into just what the cost of that coverage is, but it also gets into, uh, you know, you can have all the risk evaluation. The question is, who's going to be liable for it? Um, and I would think that, uh, you know, 
certainly Sonoka would know that, as would whoever it is working with in the insurance community. Okay, and, and when you say self-insured, some of that perhaps could be risk that would be ultimately borne by the company itself, yeah. not, not the carrier. You'd have a stop-loss policy, for instance, where, <coughs> you know, where uh, you know, the, the company would say, here, we'll be liable for the first $100,000 on each and every claim up to you know, X number of dollars. After that, the insurance company would come in. I appreciate that last comment. It's kind of going down the road. I wanted to ask a quick question. Did you ever see fine money used uh, in these situations? And it might be a better question for DEP, but, you know, they put some pretty massive fines. Is any of that money ever used for restoration for people's loss? Could, I'm not sure. Couldn't tell you. I mean, okay. it, it would make, I mean, you know, certainly. You want you know, to object to that? Is where, you know, <laughs> I mean, the question is where do the fines go? Yeah. Um, and that's a, you know, I would. You would hope it would go to the people who are in danger, or it would go into funding programs uh, along the lines of what was talked about here uh, to make sure that you have adequate personnel to evacuate. Well, they gave some a laundry list of some things where the money did go, and it was neither one of those types of things, but it seemed like that might not be a bad resource uh, to at least think about either for expanding communication services or in some shared costs, like you suggested, yeah. maybe they pay up to the first one hundred thousand dollars, and then insurance would pick something up. So, you've given us something to think about, and I do appreciate that. I would that. think that the fines, <laughs> of course, I'm always happy to grab for that for on behalf of our policyholders. Sure. But I would bet that if I was in the emergency services end, I'd say, you know, you you can get it in premium. Uh, you know, you know, they can't. And frankly, your premiums are going to be better probably if you have better EMS services yeah. and responsibilities and technology. So I think that's something we could be looking into. Uh, any other questions from the members? Uh, before we close, I do want to take a moment to thank our PR people. They do a great job not only videotaping us, providing us a sound system, but also streamlining this out to our constituents that cannot be there. For those of you in the audience that have been staying in Stallworth with us, thank you very much for your participation. This will be available on PCN a little later. And to Chris Quinn and his staff, and my own staff, Morgan and Bob and everybody, thank you very much for the work that's been done. And Chris, do you have any closing comments? No, Ch Chairman Benninghoff, I would simply like to say thank you for, for bringing the committee down. I appreciate everyone. It's good to get out of Harrisburg and come into districts. On that motion, we will uh, adjourn. Thank you very much.